we're on air. So, um, well, okay. Um, just give me one more minute. I have to change something else. All right. Um, hello, friends. Welcome to the 2016, uh, 2017 Global Dialogue on Waste. Um, since 2013, we've been making high quality knowledge easily accessible and consumable to leaders anywhere in the world. Um, for us, the qualification um, to be a leader was uh, taking a step towards finding solutions to and through waste. And um, a leader doesn't have to be someone with a leadership position, but anyone anywhere in the world belonging to any community and at any point in their lives or profession. Um, so, um, you know, you know, no single community or person has a monopoly on leadership. All you need to be, uh, is to be able to wish to make change. And um, if not for our work, most of this information would have stayed immobilized or landfill than lengthy PDFs or uh, would have been limited to expensive international conferences. So we are extremely happy about the impact we've been creating. But um, this is just a drop in the ocean compared to the scale of challenges we face, which are all planetary. We have our battles to fight and uh, we'll have many heroes, successes and failures. So I request you to get ready to lead and take the next step towards improving life on our precious pale blue dot. For those um, who are not ready yet, take your time. And uh, when you're ready, we'll be here to help and guide you to take the next step. And I'll be here to help you in any other way possible. In addition to the uh, the global dialogue on waste, every year we also publish uh, uh, waste pioneers list. And once the pioneers list is uh, published, uh, uh, we also do interviews with the thirty organizations or individuals who are doing amazing work, um, sharing their stories, sharing their solutions on social media. In addition to that, we also have a community newsletter. What that means is if you're a contributor of your, uh, or you, if you're a panelist on Be Waste Wise, you could use our newsletter as a platform for you. So if you have any work updates, if you have any achievements that you'd like to share, if you have any articles that you've written, send it to us and then we'll share it with our community using the community newsletter. And um, this year, um, uh, for, for the 2017 Global Dialogue on Waste, we have uh, about 330 registrations which is, uh, you know, we're really happy. It's an overwhelming response. Thank you very much for your support. Um, and uh, in, and uh, one last update. Uh, this comes from our LinkedIn um, group, LinkedIn community. Um, Heather Troutman, researcher at the Hafen City University, Hamburg, has posted that she was selected to chair a technical session at the sixth International Marine Debris Conference, which will take place in San Diego, California from 12th to 16th of March, 2018. Uh, they're looking for um, a successful case studies. And uh, this conference is being organized by NOAA, which is the National Oceanic and uh, Atmospheric Administration and the UN Environment. So if you want more details, you can go to the LinkedIn group and you'll be able to find more details there. So um, coming to today's um, uh, session, uh, we'll be talking about um, what practitioners worldwide who are at the front lines and practice and waste management, what kind of challenges they're facing, how they're dealing with them, and uh, and we'll just find find more about their experiences working in this space in different parts of the world. Um, um, first, we have uh, Mani Vajpayee. Um, uh, he's the CEO and founder of uh, Banyan Nation, which is a, uh, well, I'll, I'll let him uh, tell you more about, you know, what he's doing and, um, about his company. Money, welcome to the 2017 Global Dialogue on Waste. How are you? Thanks. Thanks. Uh, always a pleasure chatting with you. Um, to talk briefly about our work at Banyan Nation, uh, Ranjit, I can hear you uh, feedback back to me. So if you can. Thanks. Um, basically, the work we do at Banyan Nation comprises of um, uh, solving some solutions in the plastic uh, uh, waste management space in India. And uh, our work spans across the entire value chain, starting from collection, transportation, uh, all the way in the back end to plastic recycling. So um, uh, our team at Banyan Nation, I think what we've learned in the last few years is there's no silver bullet. I mean, there's no magic solution to solving the waste crisis in India, uh, particularly in the plastic value chain that we are focusing on. Uh, innovations across the value chain, right from integration of the informal sector in the front end to 
uh, polymer engineering uh, innovations in the back end to ensure high quality plastic uh, is manufactured, recycled plastic is manufactured so that you compel brands uh, to use more and more recycled content instead of virgin content as is probably the need of the hour. So um, that's what we do at Banyan Nation and we've been doing at Banyan Nation for the past three and a half, four years since we've uh, begun our work in India. Right. And um, today, so um, our plan is to discuss uh, how, um, well, uh, well, let me just put a context around this um, topic. So um, the informal sector in um, developing countries, it's um, a significant uh, part it's, uh, of the waste management um, supply chain. And um, the informal sector are entrepreneurs, you know, they're independent and, uh, and they're looking for opportunities to um, uh, for uh, for earning a better livelihood but again yeah. they're also one of the uh, poorest in um, you know cities so um, uh, that's something that needs to be considered uh, you know when when we're working with them uh, and um, there has been a lot of work um, in Latin America in Africa and in India uh, working with informal uh, recycling uh, informal recycling sector but most yeah. of that has uh, come from a nonprofit organizations uh, uh, and most of the knowledge that's available out there is from nonprofit organizations uh, engaging with the informal sector. And we haven't really had a chance to understand how entrepreneurs are doing it and which is why um, we, we thought it'd be a great idea to have money here uh, to talk about what his experiences are in engaging with them. And uh, this topic was suggested to us by Narsinga Panigrahi from um, Orissa, Bhubaneswar. He's organizing a viewing session again today um, with his friends and colleagues um, who are watching this together. And we're extremely happy that uh, we could, uh, 2017 Global Dialogue on Waste could act as an occasion to bring like-minded people together in a, in a local community. Um, so um, Mani, could you, could you talk to us a little bit about you know, your experiences? You know, first off, what, what would you like to tell people you know, about informal sector? And, you know, and then you know, maybe we could talk about your experiences working with them. Sure. sure. Um, when Banyan started off back in uh, 2013, um, there was lack of data really on the waste flows. And um, uh, Ranjit, you have been aware of our journey uh, since uh, 2013. I mean, back uh, from the time I called you from Apple campus uh, in 2011. Uh, uh, coming back to the informal sector, I think uh, you make a very relevant point in the sense that it's uh, very important to treat the informal sector for what they are. They are probably the most vital cog in the waste supply chain, particularly the recycling value chain in a country like India. Now, you, you, you cannot build meaningful, scalable systems um, in emerging markets without the inclusion and involvement of informal sector. I think these are the fundamental truths, right? Now, uh, I have to give you a context, uh, in the Indian context for our global viewers, um, if, if they are, um, it, if you take the example of a city like Hyderabad, I think these numbers basically give you a context uh, for us to then scale the um, uh, uh, whole, whole, uh, whole value chain. So in a city like Hyderabad, um, there's about uh, 5,000 tons of municipal solid waste generated a day. And the work we do um, is just plastics. And out of the 500 tons of post-consumer waste, close to 350, 400 tons is post-consumer plastic waste. Now, there's roughly around 20 to 25,000 rag pickers or itinerant collectors in the city of Hyderabad. And uh, uh, the rag pickers and the itinerant, uh, itinerant collectors do a fantastic job, which is something that I keep saying that contrary to what we all think, India has one of the highest uh, plastic recovery rates. And that is primarily due to the informal sector that you brought up. So without the informal sector, uh, India also would be like some of the developed countries where just collection and segregation of waste itself is a major challenge. I mean, compare India's uh, recovery systems at 70% to a West's recovery uh, system, which is around 20%. While I'm not justifying that, that is exactly the right way to do it. I'm just uh, putting, merely stating a fact that 70% of plastics are being collected by the informal sector. And the first line of defense here or the first line of pickup is the itinerant guys and the servant maids and everybody who's scavenging right from your household bin to the street corner bins. They feed into the stationary recyclers. And to give you a context on the numbers here, 
there is about 2500 to 3000 stationary collectors sitting uniformly across the city of hyderabad spread uniformly i mean we call them the kabadiwalas but um, uh, these stationary guys we call from the neck of the funnel now what we did in 2013 when we got to india was we believed that uh, these street corner stationary collectors who have a small kiosk who do about half a ton 400 to 500 kilos um, of all materials a single day would be the ideal partner or an ideal supply chain partner for a company like Banyan Nation and as i said we collect material from the informal sector particularly the stationary recyclers who are one of our suppliers i mean they are not our exclusive suppliers because banyan works with uh, directly with industries um uh, works directly with uh, informal sector recyclers and other startups and other waste management companies who are willing to give us plastic so for us uh, everybody is a supply chain Uh, as part of our supply chain and then we recycle the plastic into what we call as better plastic that we give to brands to mainstream the use of recycled plastic now once again coming to the focus of the informal sector there are two ways to look at it right the front end and the back end what i mean by the front end is purely the collection systems themselves and out of the 400 to 500 tons of materials uh, that are recovered or 350 uh, tons of plastics materials that are recovered per single day the informal sector basically does a phenomenal job in picking them up but the challenge lies in the back end recycling itself where the recycling activities are also driven by the informal sector so when we talk about informal sector we typically talk about the rag pickers and then leave them then you have the kabadiwalas then you have the traders then you have the recyclers who have the extrusion lines and grinding lines every single piece in the value chain is informal in nature and therein lies the problem because the quality of the material the compliance in the value chain ethical business practices in the value chain and all these become a huge challenge in india and to close out on the numbers hyderabad has about 20 30000 itinerant informal sector recyclers 2500 stationary recyclers about 100 and 150 massive uh, uh, 3 ton 4 ton per day aggregators and about 500 informal recyclers who take the plastics grind them up wash them and convert them into pellets each of them i believe i believe are informal sector because uh, of the way they run their business and uh, banyan's work in 2013 has been with the front end which is the stationary recyclers where we developed a technology platform to integrate over 2000 of these informal sector recyclers into our supply chain can i'll pause here for a second and then uh, take your call, uh, feedback and then probably move move forward right so and um all the numbers that you mentioned are um for a uh, city which is about um 10 million people that's uh, right the city of 8 to 10 million people that's absolutely right yeah 8 to 10 million people and it's the sixth or sixth or seventh largest city in india so um that's right your cities probably have uh, you know bigger numbers uh, and uh, and the way it works uh, with informal recycling is the bigger the city gets it kind of increases exponentially i, I don't have any uh, empirical evidence for it but that's kind of something that we observe uh, yeah and i think uh, uh, i think coming back to one of the important points here i think how do you work uh, now now taking into account the fact that we've already started working with the stationary recyclers in a city like hyderabad how do you engage with them i think to quickly uh, summarize some bullet items i think there's a lot of skepticism when we started out in 2013 when we started working with them everybody is like oh my god this is mafia um and uh, they're loan shark and it's very difficult to work with them contrary to all these assumptions when you start working with them uh, you put a very good point i mean if you treat them without uh, a pa- patronizing tone and you treat them as entrepreneurs and you treat them as people who are giving you business and you give them business back and treat them with dignity you'll do very well in penetrating the informal sector so what happened is in 2013 2014 when we started this whole uh, informal sector integration platform uh the only thing that we offered the informal sector was a steady business a good market rate and dignity and uh, uh, respect when it comes to dealing in business in fact the first two things are what they care most i mean you have to have give them a steady business of x tons per month and you also have to pay them fair market rates with on the spot payments and the informal sector immediately i apologize for that 
the informal sector immediately gives you that kind of business because they are also shopping around and they are entrepreneurs and they are very resourceful and they are big hustlers and it's very easy for us to actually work across the value chain in terms of the collection and aggregation pieces and collect almost uh, uh, the first one year we averaged about 3 tons of plastic a single day um before we started pivoting our business model and becoming more polymer engineering and plastic engineering focused company so um, uh, integrating with the informal sector has been has yielded us great results in terms of the scale uh, the one thing that uh, was a challenge for us is pricing and i will come to the topic of pricing when we uh, discuss the topic right thanks money um uh, friends so l- let me uh, remind you um this is the last day of uh, the 2017 global dialogue on ways and we're talking to uh, mani vajpay from banyan nation um and um if you have any questions or comments for mani please um use the q and a box below the um uh, below the screen and you can submit the questions and comments uh, your questions and comments and uh, we also have a viewing session from orissa bhubneshwar and they'll be able to um comment uh, they'll be able to submit their questions and comments through our chat here So um if you, if uh, you're interested in organizing viewing sessions in the future let us know and then um let's do something together. And um also one more um update uh we will be beginning a, a weekly interview series soon and um the announcement for that will will also be coming soon. So please um follow us and uh, subscribe to us uh, so that you're uh, you're updated you you keep updated. And um with that uh, and with that let's go back to money and then you know let's understand you know what kind of um what's the most important thing when you you know putting together a business i mean um, you know both of us took the steve blank um uh, class together and uh, he says you know finding a client or market is the most important so could you talk about that a little bit well uh i mean osterwalder's business model canvas uh, where you're part of the banyan uh, business team then was i mean the the fundamental idea with steve uh, blank when he talks about business whether it is movie making or a restaurant business or um a recycling business it doesn't really matter at the end of the day one thing needs to happen which is the purpose of the business is to generate value and value is just not economic value there there's there's a perceived value you, you the, your your core uh, purpose of existence is creating value and specifically when you talk about economic value there must be a customer that is actually dying to uh, pay you the right value and i think this is the key when i talk about right value uh i i uh, let me apply that in the context of the recycling because i i think it looks like you want me to talk about the numbers the reason why i took my time in the initial 5 minutes to explain and establish that the entire value chain is informal in nature is let us say young entrepreneurs and i've seen a lot of startups spawn up uh, in the last 3 4 years in the waste management space particularly in the last mile collection and the informal sector integration models using technology i think technology is one enabler what happens is it is really easy to integrate the informal sector as i was explaining they are more than happy to work with you if you give them business and you give them the right money now for you to sustain that business you need to create value in the back end and you need to have customers who purchase the materials for you that make unit economic sense if you do not create business models that generate value across the value chain you will not be able to sustain your business and as a result you won't be able to pass the value down to the informal sector and then immediately the informal sector guys cut you out and uh, they uh, can find out another supplier and uh, i i guess uh, that's probably why you've uh, picked up steve's um, uh, uh, case here and uh, uh, the 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 key thing that we learned um, in, in the lean business is there's the entire partnership and stakeholders and the supply chain right and uh, uh, the customers you need to focus on each piece of the puzzle of this model but every single piece of the uh, business model canvas is very critical to the company's success and uh, in banyan's case we are not afraid to fail fast and fail quickly for us every interaction is a learning step and we take the takeaways and 
pivot our business model and that's been our core strength really um after 2013 2014 where we were able to supply secure supplies from the informal sector we realized that the buyers of materials from banyan nation uh weren't paying us the true economic value because the buyers were themselves also small smes who were extremely price sensitive and for them compliance or ethical business practices or taxes weren't really uh, the the key pillars of their business and as a result banyan was bleeding cash on every single transaction we were doing and we could not sustain the whole relationship and banyan then started partnering with uh, large companies in the us for example we initially started working with dupont to improve the quality of uh, the material that we were recycling and fetch a higher price in the market by the end of 2014 uh, or over the end of 2015 as you probably know we brought in uh, world class plastic technique uh, plus testing techniques like spectral fingerprinting and uh, also uh, adding Uh, chemicals to the recycling process to improve the quality of plastic materials, and thereby started increasing the economic value. And thus, we became sustainable, and were also able to value the uh, sustain our uh, partnerships with the informal sector. And um, is there something specific you want me to talk about? But I, this is the general story. No, great. Uh, thanks, Mani, for sharing that. That's um, really interesting and innovative. Um, uh, you know, way of uh, dealing with this uh, really large issue, and also you know, providing good livelihoods. um so um we have a policy question um your way uh, uh kaushik chandrashekar um asks this question uh, he's asking does the solid waste management rule 2016 and the plastic waste management rules or the e waste ma- management rules do these rules um do enough for the integration of informal sector uh, what could be possible additions that could help integrate these workers better um do you have any thoughts on that Hey Kaushik, uh, thanks for the question. Uh, no, uh, it's a it's a great question. The the twenty six one. What we must uh, like really recognize here. This is my take again. Um, uh, is the policy and the government macro economic uh, and system. They are all enablers really. And uh, the specific question of whether the twenty sixteen plastic rules and the waste management rules have any provision for the informal sector integration. there are statements or there are uh, uh, concepts that these uh, uh, documents talk about where they say cities and uh, and and urban local bodies and municipalities must work towards the integration of the informal sector but at the end of the day when specifically talking about informal sector integration entrepreneurs must always recognize that unit economics and steady business is what the informal sector integrators look for and integrating them is actually to your own benefit because think about it just like the dabba walas of mumbai this is perhaps the most intricate last mile collection system that exists in a country like india and leveraging them is to our benefit right so so that is my take now there are few other comments uh, i have right once the uh uh plastic waste management rules came about and there was this issue of informal sector integration there are certain models that municipalities have been experimenting with um and and and, and i'd like to take the example of even warangal and even pune and bangalore and a lot of these places informal sector integration doesn't mean only direct interaction with them i think uh, this probably helps to expand the scope of informal sector integration If you look at a kabadi wala, he's really a dry resource collection center. For example, he's is a non-authorized dry resource collection center. Nonetheless, he's a dry resource collection center. So anybody can drop off their recyclable materials and get a price uh, or get some monies for their waste, right? Now, municipalities, in collaboration with other corporates, have established authorized dry resource collection centers where. you have taken uh, 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 self help groups or women entrepreneurs who were previously recyclers to f- get into the formal umbrella of uh, uh, government dry resource recovery systems and that is another beautiful way in which the government and corporates are engaging so to give, to set a context for the dry resource collection center take a city like warangal 
uh, you can take Pune, you can take uh, Bangalore, doesn't matter. Now, what typically happens in dry resource collection centers is just like the Kabadi Walas at a smaller, at a much larger scale, you give them a thousand square feet to 2000 square feet uh, space, you give them access to technology, you give them access to partners like Banyan Nation and or ITC and groups like that, where they can sell the material. Banyan is a great customer for uh, the dry resource collection centers and self-help group basically establish a recycling center. The waste collectors drop off the materials and get money for their materials. So that is another way in which we can formalize dry uh, uh, recovery, materials recovery and integrate the informal sector. So there is a lot of models happening and the provisions for both the plastic and the solid waste management talk about the informal sector integration. But my uh, takeaway is ma access to markets and unit economics and paying the fair price to them is only what's going to sustain them. Because at the end of the day, like you put it initially, they are entrepreneurs at the end of the day. Um, and you cannot take a patronizing or a non-profit tone to them, but a market approach uh, to informal sector integration. Right. And um, well, nonprofits have their role to play, but um, absolutely, of course. Right. Yeah. They, they have a big role to play. And um, all of us know so much about the informal recycling, thanks to, you know, lots of nonprofit work. Um, but um, let's uh, but again, uh, when coming to the, the policy, um, I know that all of these policies mentioned, they have a statement, like you mentioned, about the informal recycling sector. But again, more than policy, I think it takes political will um, or will from the municipal uh, municipalities themselves to be able to, you know, work with them, you know, have some patience and time to work with these guys. So um, uh, we have another question. Um, it's uh, from uh, let me let me add a couple of things. I think that's a very good uh, question. I think we should go a little bit. Uh, uh, um, we should explore that the topic a little bit. Um, so. Obviously, uh, groups like Chintan, Swatch, uh, KKPKP, I mean, these guys have brought the cooperative, informal sector cooperatives to the fore. And in fact, we've built upon those systems. Um, the point about the government uh, policy, there, there's a couple of things, right? When pl the, the plastic waste management rules actually makes it really interesting. What the plastic waste management rules calls for is the formalization of the value chain. It's, it's very important to uh, understand uh, so the plastic waste management rule. It says that uh, the, there, there must be a responsibility uh, for the producers to partner with certified recyclers in the back end. Uh, uh, and, and we have to tread these waters carefully. That is why when I said recycler, informal recyclers, it's an entire gamut that we are talking about, right? So there is a role for the government to play in the formalization. There are a few things that can be done. For example, um, not treating the informal sector as either the rag pickers or the kabadiwalas or the aggregators or the recyclers. You see what I'm saying, right? A, you have to identify the piece of the puzzle and B, uh, yeah. government is not the only uh, enabler, there is a, a, a startup corporate tie up with the informal sector. B, there is an economic value you have to drive, there is an access to markets you have to provide. And um, I think we are at the very initial stages of uh, all the systems being put in place. And I, I, and I believe that in the next like five to 10 years, all the stakeholders will come together. I think it's an idea whose time has come. It's a tipping point that is happening. We are at that tipping point phase. Wonderful to hear that money and uh, and um, we have um, so let me um, remind everyone that um, you can send your questions and comments using the Q&A box below and you can also uh, tweet to them uh, using the hashtag waste dialogue which is W-A-S-T-E-D-I-A-L-O-G. Um, you can tweet to us uh, at, uh, with the hashtag waste dialogue or at be waste wise. Now we have a question uh, from Narsing Panigrahi. Um, he is again uh, organizing a viewing session for us in Orissa. And he asks, uh, what kind of investments would we require to start up a plastic recycling unit in a city without any formal recycling? And, uh, and what kind of materials should we target? Uh, it's, it's an extremely broad question. Um, again, 
plastic recycling uh, uh, are you define how are you defining plastic I, I i think i'll try and quickly summarize in five six bullet items are you setting up a last mile collection business what is the value addition that you're going to be doing are you going to be just segregating plastic and then bailing it who's your customer right is your end customer a manufacturer who requires the plastic granules uh, and as a result are you going to follow through across the entire value chain is your end customer another recycler who's actually going to recycle the materials and your value is in segregating and bailing the materials so these are all the factors you need to understand before actually setting up a plastic recycling unit supply is actually the easiest thing today in india because as as i said informal sector is, is very vibrant and integrating uh, the informal sector has many models and there are many people can give you plastic if you're talking about plastic but what exactly are you going to do with the plastic and who is your end customer what is your compliance cost what is your labor cost what is your unit economics and how much are you getting for it and how much are you passing down the value chain these are all the factors for to for, for you to consider before me passing a comment on what's the uh, 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 uh capex on this one and to banyans in banyans context we started off as a very simple plastic recycling unit where the first one year uh, we had become extremely good at segregation in fact our segregation accuracy in terms of the plastic resin and ranjit uh, can probably work with you offline is extremely high we had an understanding at a resin level now where we were spectrally uh, uh, fingerprinting all the plastic that had come to us as early as in 2014 to segregate plastic that was our usp then but then we realized that our customer was not paying us enough money to sustain the business so we had to go into plastic recycling where you had grinding washing extrusion and things like that then we realized that the buyers of the granules also weren't uh, paying us uh, the real value because they wanted us to sell it sell the material without bill they wanted to be in, uh, us also to be in the informal economy now with the introduction of gst now that is the other thing that uh, ranjit you are asking right there are many enablers in the system that formalize these value chain plastic waste management rules calls for working with responsible recyclers similarly the introduction of gst also uh, did its bit in formalizing the back end value chain demonetization also help the uh, this is something that i keep talking about because i think again i'll come back uh, even for entrepreneurs the cost of plastic recycling or the rather the cost of formal ethical and compliant plastic recycling um uh, is today not valued as much in india as it should be it's changing it's better now but 4 years ago it was horrible because for you to treat your water that you used to wash the plastic for you to be in compliance with pollution control board for you to pay minimum wages for you to pay taxes both on the purchase um, uh, on the sale and i'll explain why you will be responsible for both the ends uh, in fact there is a gst provision by the way ranjit which says you can purchase material from non gst registered uh, recyclers as as, as well and there is a way in which you can legitimize the purchases there and remember in my early days i used to tell you that i used to purchase the material pay vat on it on my end sell the material pay vat on it on my end again to legitimize the entire transaction so when startups basically uh, think about uh, starting a business in the um, in, in plastic recycling i think the first thing is you really really want to understand the nitty gritties of the unit economics and the entire value chain dynamics and your customer is always comparing you to the uh, your competitor and if you are setting up a plastic recycling business your competitor is going to be an another informal guy who might cut corners and thereby make you unviable and uncompetitive so you have to pay attention to all these minutia uh, to be able to create a repeatable scalable and a profitable business i think that's the key right um and um you talking about gst this reminds me of a bunch of articles i i read recently i mean um all of them i think uh, said gst had a negative impact on the informal recycling sector um do you think you can comment on this or you know tell us what your experience has been um sure i see i mean uh, uh i don't want to take uh, uh, spend a lot of time on the gst aspect but um the transactions in plastic recycling in india historically 
have happened as an informal economy where there was no paper trace trail there was no data around the amounts of volumes of prices and things like that now you suddenly introduce uh, a thing like gst in the plastic recycling business now that is why i said you have to look at the entire value chain not just at the front end or back end think about a plastic recycler that runs an extruder line right uh, and which is about the in, in a fag end of the value chain right i mean you have the uh, rag pickers you have the kabadi walas you have the aggregators you have the recyclers right now the recyclers who are making pellets in some cases are selling to former formal businesses so if you are a plastic manufacturer and you're buying granules for me the plastic manufacturer will actually sell articles in the market right now at the retail level gst has been implemented very well and as a result the plastic manufacturer of mug and buckets mugs chairs or whatever now pushes the recycler to be gst compliant and as a result this guy is now purchasing from the kabadiwalas who are non gst compliant and uh, things like that right now there is a working capital issue that develops because of deferred uh, gst uh, 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 calculations so you see what i'm saying it's not such a big deal in fact if you have an ethical or or a gst compliant purchaser at the other end there are provisions in the gst book which allow you to actually purchase material from non gst registered people the only thing that happens is you don't get your gst refund immediately you get it one month later when you work with non gst uh, compliant people so so there will be working capital issues but it's okay i mean it's not it's not been such a big hit for us because historically we've been uh, 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 calculating the vat and cst for our uh, buyers and uh, our uh, sellers so uh, we've always been doing this so it was not a big hit for us uh, uh, for us but i hear what you're saying i i can see some people getting into trouble right and um we have um another question for you money uh, this is more about i think your business model but you could also yeah. talk, uh about it in a much more general sense you know you don't have to talk about your business model uh this is a question from uh, rohit nagar goj and he's asking are you currently planning to work with ulbs um and if yes will your business model try to capitalize on any subsidies um uh, so that's a great question um uh, we don't directly work with uh, ulbs in plastic recycling i just want to be very clear basically i don't know if you know but banyan nation um also has an entirely different business vertical uh, banyan um recently won the uh, intel department of science and technology innovate for digital india award uh, for building in waste management iot platform uh, one of the things that we do is we help cities manage their waste more effectively through technology solutions which is software solutions so that is how we interact with uh, urban local bodies but now coming to plastic waste once again it's important for us to stress that urban local bodies today don't collect any plastic uh the, it is the informal sector it is the dry resource collection centers or it is the it is primarily the informal sector that collects plastic when it comes to post consumer you have to make a difference between post industrial and post consumer so uh banyan today does not work with urban local bodies directly for sourcing plastic waste however we work with urban local bodies on a bunch of other engagements that we have all right great um, i was doing some um, back end organizing money so um all right so uh, we, we have um, only 4 more minutes uh, uh well 6 more minutes so um are there any um, final thoughts that you have you know that uh, you know there are lots of entrepreneurs like you said um uh in developing countries when it comes to informal recycling there has been a uh, you know there has been a new um energy when it comes to entrepreneurs uh, so do you have any final thoughts for them you know how, how should they think about not just the informal recycling part of it or the plastics uh, or the waste management part of it but um uh, how should they also think about an entrepreneurial life um do you have any thoughts on that Yeah uh, I I can only share what the way we uh, generally think about uh, entrepreneurship and I and I believe in value generation and value creation there must be a customer 
uh, that is dying for your existence somebody must be able to see value because of you setting up a company so in the case of banyan in the last uh, uh, right from 2016 right what banyan has done is we've realized that unless the buyers of recycled materials are really passionate about using more and more recycled content in their packaging for example uh, mainstream fast moving consumer goods companies automotive companies um uh, furniture makers uh, today in india and all these are multinational companies so what banyan nation has done in the past 18 months or so is run engineering trials with multinationals across the world uh, to mainstream the use of uh, recycled content for product uh, manufacturing and uh, uh, if you look at our journey we started off as an informal sector integrate a technology platform to integrate the informal sector then we evolved by partnering with some of the best uh, plastic companies in the world to improve the quality of recycling then we started working with brands in the back end to find buyers for our recycled plastic who are willing to pay the real price and who value our existence so it has been a constant journey of improving and iterating so that we become valuable as a company not only in terms of uh, uh, our uh, 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 improving the livelihoods of our suppliers but also in creating a very strong commodity play for ourselves uh in fact we are now a commodity in in, in about 6 months we're going to be a commodity company because we are uh, building a second unit in hyderabad um whereby we're bringing in uh, some really world class uh, plastic processing technologies uh to increase uh, the quality of the plastic basically to give you a short summary i mean we are we are bringing in cleaning technologies uh to india such that the input into our recycle into our extruders today is is of an extremely high quality so um i think the entire value chain is important the unit economics are important um uh, leveraging the enablers the policy i mean uh, 2016 pa- plastic waste management rules have been a big boon for us um uh, i after maybe i can actually share one example because it's already um, uh, open and we have already uh, demonstrated it in uh, the greenco conference organized by cii banyan nation became one of the first companies in india to do a bumper to bumper recycling with uh, uh, tata motors uh, we've demonstrated how bumpers uh, from automotive companies used bumpers or broken bumpers from accident uh, bu- bumpers from cars can be taken recycled and given back to automotive companies to make new bumpers again and uh, it's in a classic example of uh, uh, closed loop circular economy model first of a kind in india and there is a certain technology that was lacking in india to recycle the bumpers and banyan nation was able to develop that over a space of last two years so i think um, yeah, companies have to create that value yeah no that, that's wonderful and congratulations on being able to do that and uh, now um we have uh, a question from uh, nigeria uh, emeka um, is asking I'll, i'll respond to this uh, uh, he or she is asking what gst is um and G- uh, he or she is from nigeria so um gst is a government tax that was introduced in india so um uh, i don't think it would be uh, applicable to nigeria so that that's um, response to that question and uh, we have another question uh, from vivek patel um he's asking you money uh, this is a ice cream for you it's like a nice rasgulla for you um so he's asking i'm excited to see the informal recycling getting into the mainstream congratulations what's your uh, future vision with uh, banyan nation uh that's a great question vivek ban we really want to mainstream the use of recycled plastic uh, vivek i think uh, my passion today is recycled plastic is seen today not as a uh, equal alternative to virgin plastic but it is seen as a secondary alternative or a low grade alternative to virgin plastic banyan is working to eliminate that banyan is working to mainstream the use our quality the plastic quality is so good that we make actually we've trademarked better plastic by the way banyan's plastic today is called better plastic in india and that's really our burning passion in the next 2 to 3 years we want to put more and more mainstream clean plastic today uh, uh, last comment and i'll uh, plastic 
recycled plastic in india today is seen as bad because of the potential mercury contamination lead contamination value chain untraceability brands are today scared uh, they were they they are concerned if there is a child rag picker picking up the material how is the recycling happening in the back end is water being uh, recycled and that's what banin nation wants to change we want to clean the value chain completely produce the best quality recycled plastic and ensure that mainstream brands use more and more recycled plastic if you take it put it in one sentence we want to make recycled plastic the use of recycled plastic cool and and sexy and mainstream and that's really what we are going to do in the next 2 to 3 years great thank you very much mani that, that was a great session and um i hope uh, you know other entrepreneurs learned a lot from your experience um so with that i think uh, let's uh, end this session uh, you can stay on the stream but i'll hide you from the broadcast um but of course um yeah so yeah see you again and uh, thanks mani thanks for joining hey, us thanks for having me really appreciate talking to you yeah great wonderful um friends so let me um bring um cole and kirsty on online and uh that's kirsty um both of you will have to unmute yourself yeah, good morning good morning good morning hey cole how are you good good great wonderful so um uh, friends so um uh, we have um cole rosengren from um waste dive he's a staff reporter at waste dive um has been a friend um for a long time and um uh, you know been really helpful for uh, be waste wise and uh we also have kirsty pecky from the conservation law foundation and um she is one of the very few attorneys working in waste management so um th there'll be a lot of, a lot that you, you you'll be learning from this conversation uh between uh cole and kirsty and um uh finally so um let me just remind you that uh, this is the last day of the 2017 global dialogue on waste we have more programs coming up uh you know for example a weekly interview series that we're planning so the announcement will be coming soon so uh follow us and subscribe to the monthly news newsletter so that you're updated and um if you have any questions use the q and a box below to submit the questions and uh kisti or paul one of them will uh, respond to your um questions and comments and um uh, you can also use the hashtag waste dialog w a s t e d i a l o g waste dialog to send your questions or comments to us so uh with that i'll let cole take it from here cole um it's yours great thanks ranjith and um thanks for giving us this opportunity and thanks for joining us today kirsty thank you always good to talk uh kirsty and i keep up on massachusetts waste issues fairly often so nice to spread that conversation to a wider level um just to start it off it would be great if you give us a little more on your background how did you get into waste issues and uh you know why, why is this so interesting to you well you know looking back it seems inevitable that i'd worked in waste but um but probably i wouldn't have been able to predict it you know as a, as a young person um i was interested in environmental law from a very young age and I had always worked on recycling issues. I worked at our local recycling center. My mother was instrumental in, in, in setting it up. Um, so I was very aware of recycling and cared about that. And then when I went to Harvard, I actually had a job working for the college, setting up the recycling system, getting materials from dorm rooms and labs and offices to the curb. So it was a really neat student job and it was a great opportunity, but I never knew that I'd end up working in you know, the legal area around waste issues. Um, then I went to BC Law, and after that went and worked at a large firm for about um, six or seven years in Boston. And loved that, had a great experience, did a lot of land use law and real estate law as well as environmental law, which in retrospect is the perfect mix for waste because of course waste is about moving things you know, across space. Waste is about handling that actual footprint of the waste facility. Um, and then also the environmental issues, the, the hardcore contamination issues. So it makes sense that I got here that way. Um, and then when I, I was home with my kids for a while, I was doing pro bono work and was asked by citizens, local citizens to um, oppose the expansion of the largest landfill in Massachusetts, the Southbridge landfill, um, what was going to become the largest landfill if it was allowed to expand. Uh, so I kind of got in at the last minute on that. Uh, and we learned a lot. I represented 300 citizens all the way to our highest court in Massachusetts. Um, ultimately, we were unable to stop the expansion, 
However, kept working on it. Worked, uh, you know, as my kids got larger and got, you know got older, and I went back to working full time. Started working with a lot of nonprofits, um, and finally landed at Conservation Law Foundation. Um, and that landfill, they, they tried to expand it again. And now they're not going to be able to, largely in part for the efforts that we've done at Conservation Law Foundation and a lot of other groups, you know, great nonprofit groups across the state. So that's yeah. kind of how I got here. Okay, no, and the um, the Southbridge case has captured everyone's attention here in Massachusetts for sure. And it was a big surprise earlier this summer when they announced um, this in their quarterly earnings call, uh, Casella Waste Systems, a large regional waste company here in New England. Right. That, uh, due in part to a lot of community pressure, and there's many twists and turns in that, but it was a big surprise that they weren't going to kind of continue to fight for that one. And in our conversations, I found interesting you mentioned this idea of we assume that these regulations, state, local, federal regulations are being enforced when it comes to landfills. Right. You found that's not necessarily the case due to a variety of factors. Perhaps regulators just aren't getting ad adequate budget funding. They, they're not even there in the first place. And so it's fallen to you and some citizens in some cases to kind of check if these things are being complied with, right? That's absolutely correct. Um, and I've been, uh, surprised and alarmed by the degree to which a lot of regulations have been ignored. Um, Massachusetts, it, we think of ourselves as being pretty good on the environment, you know, it, being pretty protective. And people assume that the water coming out of their tap is clean. So uh, we think things are running pretty well, and that's not necessarily the case. Um, in 2008, when I was representing the 300 citizens, uh, you know, we pushed back on a lot of the issues around how the landfill was permitted and, and some real serious problems with the permitting, but it never occurred to me that the landfill was already leaking, which it was. Um, so that's something that we were able to use this time because we understood what was happening around the groundwater wells. Um, an even more uh, distressing case is the one in Saugus, Mass, in which we assumed, we knew that it was an unlined landfill, um, but we assumed they had the groundwater monitoring that are required by federal regulations. Um, turns out they don't. So that's, so, I, so you know, to, I don't know if you want me to jump into it right now, but I think that that's kind of the, uh, the big message that I have looking at this. You know, you have to understand, first off, the nature of landfills, right? There's, uh, landfills that are unlined. And now every landfill company is going to tell you their landfill is lined. Um, I know you've heard this probably from waste companies that it's got a clay liner. You know, they'll say in, in Massachusetts, it's always Boston blue clay. You know, and that's, mm. you know, that's something that you're here uh, because there's a natural clay layer. Many times these landfills are put in um, wetlands or, you know, coastal areas. So yeah, there's clay there naturally and maybe they'll augment it a little bit, but They'll say there's a clay liner. That's pretty much unlined by federal standards now. In 1991, in the United, across the entire United States, uh, the EPA instituted regulations that required a plastic liner, a leachate collection system, and also a gas collection system in all liners, in all landfills, excuse me. Um, and we're talking, as everybody knows, about solid waste, you know, municipal solid waste. So that's commercial waste, that's anything that you're using in your household. What that means is, you know, in the United States, that means probably 85,000 different chemicals are going to be in that landfill. Um, anything nasty that you can think of, radioactive material, uh, you know, heavy metals, PCBs, the emerging contaminants like PFOAs, uh, you know, PFOAs, uh, all of those contaminants are gonna be in your landfill. So, the liner systems and groundwater monitoring are system of wells around the landfill to determine whether, um, you know, there's actually been actually been a leak by testing the groundwater um, for about 200 chemical chemicals. That's required uh, in in all landfills in the United States. So when you're working on a landfill, the first step is to find out if there is a liner system, if there is a leachate collection system, and if there's a gas collection system. I assumed that all the landfills in Massachusetts had the groundwater monitoring system. And when we asked the Massachusetts Department of Environmental Protection for those tests in the Saugus landfill, um, they told us they did have them, come on in and look at them. And we went in and there were no groundwater monitoring tests. And we went back a couple of days, they said, yeah, come on in, come see the, you know, yeah, come see the results. It's quarterly monitoring is required, come on and see it. 
Um, we went through the files, they weren't there. And so they said, well, maybe they're on Bob's desk. Maybe they're in Bill's you know, book. Kit. You know, it's a big agency. Um, no, there's not any groundwater monitoring. And you know that was pretty that was pretty shocking to us. So, yeah. yeah, no, I can imagine. Um, a quick program, you know, we have a request from Ranjit to move your camera down a little bit, if possible. Oh. Thank you. Perfect. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, Great. No, and so I think um, it'd be good to maybe and keeping in mind we have some international viewers too. Let's take a step back for a minute, I guess, and mm -hmm. give a sense of how the average landfill is regulated. You know, we think right. of, there are obviously federal regulations in place, but a lot of it often falls to the state and sometimes the local level, even town boards of health in the case of right. Southbridge. What are sort of the, um, what are meant to be the mechanisms for keeping these in check, whether or not they're working? Right, um, so the the federal system in mass, in, in the United States, sets forth certain guidelines that are that have to be met. As I said, a liner system, now it's, it's RICRA, the Resource Conservation and Recovery Act in the United States, um, and it's subtitle D of that required, you know, to explains how those municipal solid waste landfill, which includes all of our kind of regular waste, not hazardous waste or sludge or any of those things, but our regulates how it's, how it's um, to be dealt with. Uh, you're required to have a dual plastic liner system, groundwater monitoring wells around the landfill, gas collection systems so you're flaring or burning it for energy. Now, those systems don't work. Regard, you know, there's, there's some fantastic work by um, Drs. Jones Lee and Drs. Lee in California, Fred, G. Fred Lee, they're fantastic. And they've outlined how those plastic liner systems also fail and how those collection systems, air and water fail. Um, so that's a whole nother topic that we can get into. But the first thing you want to check is if, you know, what systems are in place and if those systems match your federal, state, and local regulations. In the United States, the states take on that regulatory duty and interpret the federal regulations as they wish. They can mimic them entirely. They can make them a little bit stricter. Um, and, and so then that's their responsibility. In the case, for instance, of Saugus, the state made a deal with Wheel of Braider Saugus, the company that runs the incinerator and ash landfill that I'm talking about, and said, well, this has been here for a long time. It's been here since the 1950s. Uh, it doesn't have liners. It doesn't have groundwater monitoring. We're gonna let you run it until it's full as per your engineering plans. And then they just keep letting them change the engineering plans. So they did a kind of a runaround, a sidestepping of, of the regulations. Wherever you are, whether it's in the United States or another country, the first step is to check physically what's on the ground and then also check your federal government regulations to see are you know are you in compliance because again i would have assumed we were here in massachusetts and we were not and then the next thing to do once there are once you find those those groundwater monitoring reports which you know god help you hopefully you have them um, if you have those reports if you have some system of testing what leachate that garbage coffee has been released into the groundwater, into the soil around the landfill, check them to see what's being released. Um, all landfills, whether they are unlined with some kind of clay or soil liner or have a double plastic liner, as I said, according to Drs. Lee, um, they, they are gonna leak. Uh, and that's, that's just understood. The best landfill, you know, constructed most perfectly will leak within about 20, 25 years at best case scenario. And considering that, you know, in the United States, there are about 8,000 fires at landfills every year and about 2,000 landfills are 8,000 fires. Considering that there are lightning strikes, considering that there's a lot of corrosive material in the garbage, a lot of times I think that that is actually much, much, it's much earlier than 20, 25 years. Mm -hmm. So first step, check what your regs are at the federal level and check if you know what's actually on the ground because you might be you might be surprised as what you find and, and you might be able to take action to actually require them to put protections in place yeah i know and we've certainly seen that um both in massachusetts and states around the country and i guess i'd be curious to see sort of how you see the role of groups like clf Council conservation law foundation at a time when as we've talked about before budgets for state regulators are down local towns may just not have the expertise or the bandwidth. A lot of times members of town boards of health or local legislators or part-time jobs. 
you know, have you seen a need for more action by groups like yours to get involved? Um, um, Kirsten, I'm sorry. Um, I uh, can you please unmute yourself? Um, I muted you because there was some audio feedback. I'm sorry about. That. Oh, sorry. Yeah. So, yeah. No, absolutely. Uh, let me repeat your your question, Cole, to make sure that everyone heard it. So, uh, absolutely, there's more need for work by groups like Conservation Law Foundation, um, by other grassroots groups who are working with citizens to figure some of this out, and also a lot of technical expertise. And you know, to be perfectly honest, if I had a staff of you know six people right now, I could keep them busy all day working on the landfills. Through there's about a hundred landfills operating through New England. I could and you know ash and municipal solid waste. Um, as you know, the ash or landfills are required to run a, an incinerator uh, because there are just so many uh, problems, and this area is so underserved. So, as you said, there are federal regulations. In the United States, we can bring citizen suits to enforce those regulations. So not only are there violations of RICRA, I bet at most of the landfills through New England, but you know, the ones I've looked at, there are, uh, because RICRA, that federal regulation, requires that you're not allowed to release contaminants into the environment. We also have the Clean Water Act, um, which you're not allowed to release environment uh, contaminants into our navigable waters. So if it's going into a river or a stream or a wetlands, it's going to end up in the river. It's it's illegal. So that's not being enforced at the federal level. Level and the state governments are woefully underfunded. And I would bet that's the the case around the world. Unfortunately, you know, environmental protection is just not made a priority as it should be. Um, so what we found is that not only do we find that the state government was not necessarily being as proactive as they could be in updating the landfill, like the Saugus landfill, but on top of that, those groundwater monitoring reports for different landfills, the company or municipality submits them to the DEP, the Department of Environmental Protection, and they sit on a shelf. There's nobody at the agency whose job it is to say, wow, this landfill's leaking, we need to shut it down or we need to start remediating it or doing things differently. Um, so I think that that is probably the case throughout the country. Uh, I would love to hear, but it's not, but I think unfortunately it probably is. Never mind the operating landfills, we have a lot of closed landfills across the country too, and I'm sure across the world that are also leaking. So that's a problem. And then our state, our, our municipal government in Massachusetts is incredibly powerful because we don't have very powerful counties or we don't have powerful regional government. So our municipal government can actually be a huge force for change, which is another reason why grassroots groups can be incredibly important and powerful. And we found that in the Southbridge case that the Board of Health in Charlton was very instrumental. It's the next town over from Southbridge. They were very instrumental in making this happen. And also the town government of Southbridge was very instrumental in really looking at what was happening now. Um, around that landfill. So they can be very powerful. Unfortunately, as you said, Cole, they're not just part-time, they're, they're volunteers, right? So you've got a teacher and a dentist and you know a couple other folks who are really nice people volunteering for their community. They don't know much about landfills though, um, or incinerators. So it's, it can be a lot on them and it's a lot to expect them to be as courageous as we need them to be to protect our environment. Yeah, and I can imagine one sounds like that's where, you know, groups like yours have stepped in. Um, I'd like to get some thoughts for kind of how this could be applied internationally. But first, I'd be curious, um, what else, what's coming up in the future for either your Zero Waste Project or for CLF? I know obviously the, um, the Will Brader lawsuit continues. Uh, what else is on your agenda for the fall? Well, so I'm excited about a couple different things. One thing is that, um, as I think most of the viewers probably know, you can't just shake your fist at landfills and incinerators. Um, as dangerous and polluting as they are, we have to have a better alternative in place. And we know that zero waste programs that reduce, reuse, recycle, and you know, really change how we handle our waste so that we've got a sustainable circular economy um, really work and save us a lot of money at the municipal and, and personal level and also create a lot of jobs. So, that's really important to institute those programs. 
Uh, and the city of Boston is actually beginning a planning process this fall, a zero waste planning process. So they've hired an incredible team of, um, of experts to help them out with that. They're gonna have a series of public meetings. I'm really excited to be a part of that. I think that's gonna be transformative. Um, I'm also very excited about the waste work, the, the food waste work that's happening in Massachusetts. Uh, the Mass DEP, as tough as I am on them, the people who are there work really hard and care very much about these issues. They just don't have enough uh, manpower and enough money. I mean, they just lost people over and over again. So our Mass Department of Environmental Protection has instituted a large-scale food waste ban for anybody who produces more than a ton of waste a week. Uh, food waste a week, they're required to divert it from landfills and incinerators. They have to compost it or process it in an aerobic digester or, or find some other way of, of reusing it. So that um, it seems to be working, which is really exciting. And the Mass DEP seems to have done a really good job on that. They're going to release a report on that very soon. Mm -hmm. And I'm hoping that we can take that success and um, encourage the mass DEP to uh, adopt this at a you know at a higher level, so that if you're creating a half a ton of food waste as a business, and then and keep ramping it up, so soon all food waste is out of our landfills and incinerators, because I think that would really be transformative and something that we should be doing definitely throughout New England. Um, and then finally, I I continue to try and determine exactly which are the most dangerous. Um, municipal solid waste and ash landfills throughout New England. So we're trying to look at, okay, Saugus being unlined and without groundwater monitoring. Again, you might be told wherever you are, you know, uh, the government doesn't want you to, you know, rock the boat. Their jobs are hard enough. So many times you'll be told, oh, there's monitoring, but it won't necessarily be the kind of monitoring that you want it to be or really work. So make sure you keep checking whether the systems are in place to protect the public health. And that's something that I want to keep doing throughout New England and figuring out, are there other spots where people are really in danger the way they are in Saugus, Massachusetts, and the towns around them, Revere and, and, um, and Lynn? Yeah, no, I think that's very important. And it's a tough balance, right? So many, particularly in the Boston metro area, these disposal options right now, it's either that or it sends stuff a lot farther away, right? And so finding that balance yeah. of, and I know the goal of long term zero waste. Right, exactly, exactly. You don't want to export it. You don't want to be using these poorly regulated facilities. The goal of zero waste is eventually to not need disposal options at all. Right, right. right. I mean, yeah. that. Well, you know, we have regulations in Massachusetts in place if we enforce them. Those waste ban, we have waste ban regulations mm -hmm. that, that state that you're not allowed to put out not only the food waste I talked about earlier, but also cardboard, paper, bottles, cans. A lot of other materials are not allowed to go into in landfills and incinerators, but the Mass DEP estimates that 40% of what is going into landfills and incinerators are those materials. Wow. So that's a real area of focus for me to enforce, again, start off by enforcing the regulations you have. Wherever you are, I bet they're not being enforced enough. And if that's the case, whether it's on the zero waste end of it or on the facility end of it, you can make a tremendous dif difference and raise awareness of how dangerous these facilities in the system, you know, are right now by doing that. So that's, mm -hmm. that's a really good place to start. Yeah, no, and I think that's a great um, first piece of advice and kind of transition into how folks could use this in other countries, perhaps. And it's tricky because I know regulations are obviously so different everywhere. Right. And of course, you're mainly focused in New England. But any kind of general thoughts for someone who wants to, you know, to get involved or pay a little more attention to what's happening near them? Yeah, I, I would say first off, water, water, water. Um, mm -hmm. People care deeply about the cleanliness of their water. Um, in Massachusetts, we have a mixed bag of sewer systems and, and water from reservoirs and, um, and aquifers, you know, so water systems through, throughout cities and personal wells. Um, you want to make sure that those, that those systems aren't being impacted by waste facilities. Uh, and many times they are, and, and, you know, and people don't realize it especially personal wells will sometimes be impacted. It's a lot easier to prove whether there's contamination in the water than there is to prove whether it's, there's contamination in the air. Hmm. So I, I care deeply about the air pollution impacts of incinerators and landfills, um, but it's more difficult for me to change those regulations because those are usually at a federal level and very entrenched. Um, than it is to, and it's also very difficult to prove exactly what's happening in the air because it's 
air. Uh, you know, and, and, and air experts will go around and around and torture you, you know. Water, <laughs> water is a little more straightforward. Hmm. So, so I find that it's, it's a better investment of your time to read, you know, you're, you're going to want to fix everything. If you have a facility you're concerned about, whether it's an incinerator or a landfill, look at the water impacts. Look at the water impact of the leachate that's leaking from the ash landfill or, or municipal solid waste landfill. Um, look at the leachate that's pumped from those facilities and where it goes. If there are, are coolants being used, for instance, the Wheel of Raider Saugus incinerator, which is one of the oldest ones in the country, that incinerator takes the leachate from the ash landfill and cools the uh, ash with it. And then a, the other leachate is brought to a waste sewer, you know, wastewater sewer treatment plant. Sewer treatment plants can't handle leachate. So that's another place for you to, to work and say, wait a second, what's in this leachate? And then what's coming out of the pipe into the river? So those are areas where I think that there's, you know, real potential for action. And then, so, so I would say water rather than air if possible. Mm -hmm. Another piece of advice I would give is, um, you know, I think about things as a lawyer. So I look at the law and I want to enforce the law, but I need good facts. And generating those facts can be incredibly resource intensive. So wherever you are, whatever system you're working with, try and find the facts that already exist that from the waste company. Um, there are usually some kinds of tests that are required, and there is usually um, reporting of failures of the system. Um, focus on those. You know, if you're going to do a, a legal challenge or a grassroots campaign, focus on what you know, but the waste company themselves have said. Um, so you don't have to spend time debating what's true and what's not. There's a lot of dangerous stuff that's happening that the waste companies are reporting, just nobody's paying attention. Yeah, no, I think that's a good point. One to go back to the Southbridge example, we how we learned about the landfill closure was from their quarterly earnings report, which is yeah. you know not a widely read document by the average person. You know, um, yeah. so there's a lot of stuff out there that you just got to know where to look for it. I guess that makes that's, sense. That's that's true. Yeah, yeah, and it's really important that we have journalists like you working on this so that we can um, tap into the good work you've done and always you know sure. I I read waste dive. I try and look at you know as much of the stuff that's that's happening. EcoCycles, another um, mm -hmm. organization that puts a lot of good information out there. Um, Gaia, of course, Zero Waste Europe. There are a lot of great folks who are writing fantastic stuff. So if you're working on something, if you have a fire at the facility you're at, or if you know it's a certain type of um, incinerator or um, or a landfill, look look it up. You know, it, it, you'll be amazed at what you'll find sometimes. Um, Earth Justice has also done a lot of fantastic work around incineration. So a lot of the background is already there for you, and you can find out a lot that way. So it's really worth doing. No, that's a good point. Um, I think it's uh, for as widespread as waste management is in our lives, it doesn't get a lot of attention in the media necessarily, but it is if you know where to look, you know, and, um, and even a lot of us working on it don't necessarily connect with each other as often as we should. So you right. Know, right. Probably, like you said, it's probably someone who could be an expert on this particular topic and you just need to find them a lot of times. You know, and everybody's so nice about helping out too. Mm -hmm. I mean, I mentioned Dr. Lee earlier. I'm a huge admirer of his work. Um, there's a gentleman named Peter Anderson out of Wisconsin who's done familiar, fantastic work uh, around air issues. He's great. Uh, at Earth Justice, they're really nice people at Earth Justice and they have incredible expertise and they will help you out. Gaia, everybody at Gaia is really nice, G-A-I-A. Uh, you know, these people want to help you to, um, to protect your public health and your, and your community. And they understand what you're going through because they've been in the trenches themselves. So reach out to people and, and you know, it's a really nice community. They'll be happy to help you. Yeah, no, I've uh, certainly found that to be the case myself. Um, so we got about 15 minutes left and we're um, a reminder to viewers, we're happy to take any questions as they come in. Um, please feel free. Until we get some, something that's come to mind, and I know you don't work on this as much, but maybe you could give just kind of a basic sense. We always talk about regulating disposal facilities, you know, landfills, incinerators. What should we be watching out for with, say, uh, recycling facilities, material recovery facilities, composting, AD? What mm -hmm. are potential issues there to be watching for? Well, you know, um, these facilities are not going to be successful unless they minimize nuisances and unless they're really well run. Um, so 
there's a tremendous amount of pressure on those facilities to do a great job. And many folks are doing a great job running these facilities across the board. Um, but that being said, they have to be properly cited. If you if you try and if you try to put a farm in a, in a densely populated suburban neighborhood, everyone's going to be unhappy, right? And there's and, and a farm is not a dangerous use, but it's just going to get on your neighbor's nerves. Uh, so the same is true for composting, recycling facilities, and AD facilities. There's a certain amount of truck traffic. There's no matter what type of facility you run like that, there's going to be a certain amount of noise and odor. Um, they're minimized if it's run well, but they, should, they have to be properly cited. You can't just plonk them in the middle of Times Square. So, right. yeah. So I think that's important. I also think that uh, the successful systems that I've seen have rigorous and constant education, and they have kind of a carrot and stick attitude about making sure that their users are not um, as what I call aspirational recyclers who are putting stuff in the bin that's not recyclable. Um, my husband accuses me of being an aspirational recycler all the time. Said so you should know better. So no, I think it's really, no, it's not recyclable. <laughs> so you, you have to if it just because it has the triangle on it doesn't mean it's recyclable, or it doesn't mean it's recyclable in your system. So you have to try as a user to be good about that. But then more importantly, the system has to have a mechanism in place for continued education for some kind of ticketing or fine if you're screwing it up over and over again, and for some kind of inspection to make sure it's happening. So I think that's that's got to happen for all of these systems if they're going to be successful. And we have to keep also being, I think we have to be very, very honest about what works and what doesn't. If something's not recyclable, we should be publicizing that it's not recyclable mm -hmm. and finding some way of saying, all right, either this is a material we have to ban. I mean, I think that, I think, uh, Polystyrene is a perfect example. It, it, it just it's nasty. So you know we have to we have to kind of suck it up and be honest about when something's not really working and when it's costing the municipality or local government or citizens more money than it should be. Mm -hmm. you no, know, it's a good point. Uh, the talk of contamination in recycling is a big big conversation right now in the industry. Working on how to educate people, how to work with people on that. Yeah. And um, it's interesting you mentioned the polystyrene. We have a viewer question, actually, about extended producer responsibility. I know it's an area you don't work as much in, but we've seen a lot of talk about this lately. Um, California, Connecticut. What are you hearing in a legal sense in the waste world about this? Well, you know, uh, in a legal sense, so I, I feel like my expertise is looking at the uh, re regulations and laws and then, you know, trying to look at the systems as a whole. I'm not always the best person on the ground for, you know, looking at markets and things like that. And there are a lot of people who have a lot more expertise in that than me. I, I will say, though, that there are certain types of EPR legislation that seem to work. And so I think it depends on, I think it depends on your waste stream and what you're dealing with. And I think, uh, I don't know. I, I it, it, you know, I've heard different experts will wrangle about whether EPR is the best thing ever or going to crush an industry that's, that's been burgeoning. Um, I think you have to look at your situation and say, all right, th as I as I just said about polystyrene, this is not a product that I want to see in anything I use. Hmm. So one way to influence that is to institute pay as you throw programs because I am amazed if you find the right price point for your bag or bin, people will stop buying certain materials if they realize they have to throw it out and then pay more for their bag or bin. So mm -hmm. that's one way of getting at the problem that I think works really well. And then also, you know, publicizing, yeah, this, you no, know, you know, it has a triangle on it, but it's not recycling. That education, you know, can also minimize people's use. But at the end of the day, you've got to figure out do you want to put an EPR system in place, or do you want to outright ban something? Hmm. Um, personal bag, you know, uh, plastic single-use grocery bags. I think that they should be outright banned. I I don't think there's a need for them. There's other materials that work better. We can, you know, re there are reusable bags people can use. Not that hard. Let's do that. Other things not as easy to replace, right? So we want to send them back to the brilliant engineers at these different companies. And, and in Massachusetts, we're really lucky because we have a lot of schools that want to look into these problems, too, mm -hmm. and try and figure out, all right, how do you make kitty litter that actually uh, doesn't have to go into a landfill? You know, we've got people trying to figure that stuff out. So sometimes in that situation, EPR is going to work.
Okay. Now I'm glad you mentioned the bag example. Um, Massachusetts has a lot of kind of grassroots activism around that right now. I forget the exact count. See the 50 to 60 uh, local municipalities. Yeah, I, I want to say 53, 54. Okay, um, that's which, right. Yeah, which is you're right, and uh, and that's up from I think 20, 23 over the last couple of years. Mm -hmm. So um, we have 351 municipalities in Massachusetts. Uh, Mass Green, a guy named um, Brad Verter, has been acting to give local municipalities kind of a toolbox for how to pass a bag ban in their community because many times they will get pushed back. Oh, well, we'll just allow this kind of bag or uh, it's not going to work in this store, but it'll work in that store. And when it's happened and worked in other municipalities, they can take those lessons and transfer them and, and um, help people figure it out in their community. Every community is different. There's going to be you know different challenges in every community, but they've done a really great job of um, of doing that. And they're also doing polystyrene bags bands. I believe mm -hmm. they have in the early 20s something like you know yeah. like 25, I think. Yeah, no, I think that sounds right. Um, no, and I'm glad we got a chance to talk about Mass Green Network actually, because I think they they tie into this well. They're a good example of how citizens can get involved and share resources with each other. And yeah, the people there's a great kind of email listserv going around when. Folks in one town are trying to do it. They'll email people from another town to hear how they did it successfully. You know, know the same talking points. And it's this is more maybe not necessarily your area, but interesting in a legal sense that they're trying to do this to force action on a state level. Because right now, to get anything past the state level is challenging. There's more lobbying efforts. It just takes longer. And so their goal is to have so many different local regulations that there will be kind of an outcry for a standard state approach. This Brad's told me before, um, it's interesting to see that because to get stuff past any kind of waste legislation is hard at the state level, but locally it's possible right now, it seems like. I think I think you're absolutely right, Cole. I, you know, Massachusetts has, was it 7 million people? Mm -hmm. um, getting anything passed at a, a government of that size is very difficult. Uh, not that it's not a tremendous amount of work to get the municipalities to do it. And, you know, 50s is not 351, so there's a lot more work to be done. But yeah, I think it also shows uh, you know a groundswell you know but, you know that, that there's a, it's a pivotal moment to change these things in the, in the state. So I think people are excited about it for that reason too. Yeah, no, agreed. Um, and another just side note on that, an interesting development is we're seeing a lot of uh, preemptive state laws happening right now, and that's sort of a, something else for people to be aware of. There's basically a, a ban on bans, I call them. You know, they put they write this so that no local action can happen at all. It hasn't happened in mass yet, but other states have passed it or trying to pass it. So okay. something for folks to watch out for. Well, unfortunately, when you pick one, and, and this is maybe another piece of advice for folks, when you pick one product, when you pick, you know, um, bags, for instance, uh, then the industry unifies against you. Um, and mm -hmm. we found that with the bottle bill in Massachusetts. The, uh, the industry spent $12 million you know, against expanding the bottle bill in Massachusetts. So when you pick one waste stream, it sometimes means that you're going to get a unified response from the industry that might crush you. So sometimes it's better to look at the broader principles um, and and also try and attack the the, the heavier problematic issues. I think that um, food waste, it, it, we've seen so much movement. London, uh, New Jersey, New Jersey, you know, like, I, you know, if food waste has become a hot topic because people care about feeding people too, which is so awesome. So we've got momentum in that direction. And then on top of that, people understand the climate change impacts of methane. So in that, and food waste is what causes methane in the landfill. So people are getting excited about that too. So it's important to focus on the right fight that's going to take a lot of waste out of the system or the most dangerous waste out of the system and hopefully not have those, you know, really unified opposition. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think that's kind of a good ending note, this idea of how to make it personal for folks. So often waste feels like there's something that goes away that, you know, you put it at the curb and you don't have to think about it. And so whether it's pointing out health effects from the disposal site near your house or the benefits that you could have from, you know, saving your food scraps or doing, you know, just all these kind of things, making it on personal terms, it can make it, it can easily feel kind of beyond you and all this legal stuff can get the average person thinking, well, it's not my problem. Well, but it. It's all of our problem. Yeah, no, RICRA, the Resource Conservation Recovery Act and Clean Water Act, they're enforceable by citizen suits here in the United States. So, and I, and I think you're right. You know, you've got to make it personal. 
Um, you've got to make it personal, but not get overwhelmed. It's okay if you, you know, it's okay if you work hard and make progress. Uh, you know, I got beat down, uh, you know, in the first the first time that the, that um, Casella was expanding the Southbridge landfill. But this time, they're they're closing it. They're closing it next year. So don't feel like what you're doing isn't impactful, isn't important, even if it's not immediately successful. You're changing the conversation. You're meeting great people and doing great work. And it's a lot of fun. It's really worthwhile. Yeah, no, it really is. It's been um, fun getting to know folks in my time doing this, too. It's uh, there's a, a wide world of people, like you said, to talk to. And everyone seems happy to share it because this just doesn't get a lot of attention in your local paper. And that's a whole other media conversation we could get into, you know, as <laughs> are losing their own staffs, just like state agencies. There's yeah. fewer people that are informed to talk about this. Um, yeah. But because so many waste issues are local, these contracts are often local. Things are happening on a local level. It's important for people to pay attention. Uh, yep. It can be hard to find those outlets, but there's groups out there often, you know, at least at if not at a local level, at a state level, there's usually somebody in your community talking about this, it sounds like. Absolutely. And people are interested in it, too. So, yeah. And um, we're almost out of time, but just on a final note, um, be good to mention that CLF does national work as well, right? And I know you don't do that as much. No, through New England. Through New England. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, so we Did also. Did onto the NSPS lawsuit or am I? Well, we, no, we do. I, I guess, I, I, let me take that back. So we're a regional organization. Um, we're one of the first uh, environmental law nonprofits that was ever established in, in the United States, 1966, I think, was when we were established. So um, we, and we work on a lot of different areas, oceans, rivers, air, energy. I mean, you know, um, my program, the Zero Waste Program, is part of the Healthy Communities Environmental Justice Program because we didn't get there, but, you know, this is something that hits us all personally, most especially because our most vulnerable populations, our environmental justice populations in whichever country we're in, are the ones who live next door to a waste facility. Um, Southbridge is an environmental justice population. Saugus is an environmental justice population. The communities around it are. That's always how the story goes. And that's one of the drivers for this work. So. So CLF does a, a wide range of different types of uh, lobbying, litigation, and other types of advocacy, and just providing expertise for people who are doing good work themselves. Right, right. No, that's good. And I think uh, providing expertise on stuff, you know, other other communities are, it was the NRDC lawsuit they teamed up with, if I'm not mistaken, it, right? Over that one, and another uh, another uh, suit that you'll be familiar with is the, um, uh, for instance, the Green Line extension and the Green Line you know, in Massachusetts when we had when we were in, in expanding our driving infrastructure, Conservation Law Foundation made sure that there was public transportation always included in that, and we do a lot of work around transportation still. Uh, and then also energy, the the um, Lewis case that we've done a lot of work on throughout New England on that, those issues too, making sure that our climate change impacts are as you know as um, Got a lot of work to do there, but we're working on, working on climate change impacts as much as possible. So, yeah, no, and waste is certainly part of that. It does not yeah. get mentioned as much of that in that conversation, but it definitely is. So, no, you know, actually, I'm I'm um, beginning a report. We're, well, I've got a new intern coming, beginning a report on the climate change impacts of waste in Massachusetts and mishandling our waste because we have to change how we do production. That's a whole nother whole another conversation for another day, but transportation, energy, and production of goods are what are driving climate change. And without that third leg of the stool, we're not going to solve this problem. Yeah, well, we'll be looking forward to that. Um, and if folks want to follow your work, what's a good way for them to keep up with what you're doing? A um, couple different ways. I do have, I'm on Twitter at Kirsty Petchy. Um, I'm, you can always email me, kpetchy at clf.org. Um, I'm on the website, so definitely Conservation Law Foundation, definitely look me up and reach out. And um, also, you know, give me a call. I'm very happy to help people out on these issues. So it, it's really important to me that people um, not tilt at windmills, that they really use their time productively and get as much done as they can locally and also driving a regional and federal governments. Excellent. No, and I can attest to that. Uh, you've been helpful to me. In, uh, in oh, that's very nice so. to take. Yeah, I mean, you know, I have to say Cole seems like a very fair journalist and everything I've seen, though, you know, doesn't always say exactly what I wanted to say, but <laughs> I guess that's kind of his job. So. Yeah, you know. Um, <laughs> thanks to uh, Be Wastewise for giving us this opportunity. Thanks, Ranji. Thank you so much. And likewise, if folks want to follow along, uh, what I'm doing to get in touch with me, my Twitter is at Cole Rosengren, and you can find me just about daily on the trade publication Waste Stuff. So thanks again. Great.
Um, uh, thanks, guys. Uh, thanks, Cole, and thanks, Kirsty. Uh, that was a you know, great conversation. Uh, um, I've worked a lot internationally, um, and um, I have experience there. But um, to hear this from you know an attorney working here, I think that's amazing. Uh, it was a great learning um, to do. And um, I also believe um, U.S. Um, uh, is at the you know forefront of EPR and pay as you throw. Um, mechanisms. So uh, it was amazing uh, learning about that from you too. So thank you very much, uh, guys. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah. All right. So um, I'm going to um, hide you from the broadcast and I'll bring um, uh, Thanos up um, from uh, Columbia University. So thanks, guys, and um, have, a, have a good day. You too. Thank you. You too. Yeah. All right, friends. So uh, let me bring uh, Thanos online. Um, hey, Thanos, um, can you unmute yourself? Um, it's, um, yeah. yeah. Hi, good morning, Rajin. How are you doing? Good. How are you? Fine, fine. Very good to see you also. And once again, thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to be part of uh, this very important initiative for uh, the waste management world. No worries, um, Thanos. Thanks for your time. So, um, uh, so uh, let me uh, set some context, and um, I think then we can begin the discussion. So, um, friends, uh, Thanos Botsalas, um, he's an adjunct professor at uh, Columbia University, and uh, he's been uh, working in the waste management sector for, uh, for a while now, and um, he, he travels around the world. So there, he travels around the world a lot. Um, so he, he's just back from Chile. So let's, let's try to find out, you know, what his uh, learning there is, you know, and, and um, this, this conversation uh, um, came to be because um, a while ago, um, Thanos um, traveled to some developing countries and he came back with a completely different perspective. So we thought, you know, it would be good for uh, a person, a uh, practitioner from a developed world to, uh, and uh, how his perspective has changed after going to developing countries. So I thought I, I would want to explore that a little bit so that uh, you know we can understand the different uh, scenarios in both of these countries um, and uh, both of these different parts of the world and try to see how we can work together you know to solve challenges to improve public health and uh, to improve well-being overall on this planet so um thanks again thomas for joining us uh, where are you coming back from what did you do there sorry excuse me what where did you just come back from what did you do there i just came back from chile yeah last uh, monday i was there for two and a half weeks i did some observations uh, with regards to the waste management in uh, chile so i visited some landfills in santiago and concepcion which is located down to the south i must say that the situation in uh, south america in chile at least the country i visited is completely different as compared to india where i was uh, sometime in april and obviously as compared to china where I was about a year ago. Um, so, for example, in China, we observed from the Earth Engineering Center uh, a significant a phenomenal growth of waste to energy. And that, was, that is why last summer I visited China to see all these developments, and I was there for about a month. And uh, because, you know, uh, sometimes the Chinese developments have this uh, reliability issue from uh, the rest of the world. That is why uh, we visited this, the facilities and I must say that I was uh, mesmerized by the developments over there. Uh, the people over there, the stakeholders really faced the reality and tackled the problem by building many, many waste to energy plants. So apparently the concept in China was to move away from landfills, from open dumps, because uh, the big metropolis like Beijing, which is the capital, Shanghai, Nanjing, back in the early zeros, was, uh, were surrounded by open dumps. And this, as we very, you very well said, is associated with significant public health issues. So uh, the Chinese government introduced waste to energy into the renewable energy law. They gave huge incentives for the development of waste to energy. And this uh, alleviated the problem of the open dumps. And now they do have 230 facilities. Well, to give you the comparison, in the States, we do have 77 facilities. And the very first was built in the early 70s. While in China, they built the very first one sometime in late 90s, and now there are about 230 operational facilities. And most of these are marble for the communities. And obviously China, uh, because of the huge economic uh, progress they faced the last 30 years, uh, they had to manage all this very properly. 
For example, uh, Shenzhen, which is a city located nearby Hong Kong, uh, back in the early 80s, it was only an agricultural land. While now, the population is about 15 million. Mm -hmm. So they have, to, they have to deal with waste management, with energy and water. However, they tackled the problem and now in Shenzhen, uh, we can tell that they do have some sustainable waste management. So Chinese started the development of the sustainability from the other way around, not from recycling and composting, but from waste to energy. And now they're in a very good position to invest time and effort for recycling, composting and advance uh, the other systems also and develop some integrated solutions. Uh, then I, went to, I was in India, which is a country with similar characteristics, at least on, in terms of the population size, as compared to China. And the situation was completely different. You know this better than I do, Ranjit, because uh, you did this state-of-the-art thesis a couple of years ago. And um, in Mumbai, in Delhi, in Nagpur, all these big cities of uh, India, with the population, uh, for example, Nagpur is about 20 million, Mumbai and uh, Delhi, it's about 60 million. Uh, all these cities are literally surrounded by landfills, by open dams. People are burning the waste. They're not aware of these public health issues. Plus, some people, the informal uh, sector uh, actors, uh, in order to survive and gain half a dollar to get like some sort of bread, they're just jumping into the heaps of the waste to collect some of the recyclables, like some aluminium, some plastic, some glass, something that has value in the market and uh, they are not aware of the public health issues. And the stakeholders, because I visited some stakeholders, I had some very long discussions with some stakeholders, are not really keen on facing the reality. And that is why they were talking about education, which is very, very important for a nation, but uh, we have to be realistic in some, uh, in some cases. And we have to face the reality and see about our own people what is the, the best solution to move this forward. And uh, so, and the other, the other observation in India was about the informal recycling. So I had the opportunity to have some discussions with some uh, informal recyclers. And my understanding was that uh, they're not really keen on joining the formal recycling sector. Because apparently, these people have been isolated by the communities, they have created their own habits, and um, the community doesn't treat them as professionals. So we, as waste management professionals, have to treat them as professionals because they are real professionals. They know all the different waste streams, they know the secondary markets, they know the value of the products, which is very, very important. They know the supply chain of the recycling scheme. And apparently, for example, Dr. Wilson from uh, Imperial College, he did a study about India, and the main finding was the, that the informal recycling sector contributes by 90% to the formal recycling scheme which is a very, very significant contribution. Uh, however, these people are not really keen because, again, the stakeholders has, haven't provided them with some initiatives or some subsidies. And this was my main observation in Chile, in South America, because they had, this, they had a similar problem with the informal recycling sector. However, what they did was that uh, through the Ministry of Education, through the Ministry of Health, they gave some very, very strong incentives for these people in order to join the formal recycling sector and therefore advance the public health and uh, advance uh, the sustainability of waste management. So, for example, they gave some benefits for the health of these communities or for the education of their, of their, of their kids, which is something very, very important for this region. So, this was actually my main observation, talking about uh, South America, India and China. I was in Singapore, for example, in, uh, in May, it's a completely different situation. It's a very advanced uh, nation. Uh, people are very well aware about the source separation of the different waste materials. They have achieved really high recycling rates through education, through the public, uh, the public awareness. However, they have reached a top of uh, recycling for about, I think, 40 to 45%. And the post-recycled waste, that means the waste that doesn't have any value in the market, or any recovery potential, it's been combusted in uh, waste to energy plants. And apparently, uh, now uh, Singapore, they are about to introduce a new law, a new legislative framework for the beneficial uses of the residues of the bottom mass that's being produced from waste to energy to be used 
for land reclamation. And then I was in Hong Kong, which again a very interesting example, because apparently, even if it's considered to be one of the most developed nations, talking about uh, the growth, the GDP, the culture of the people also, uh, talking about waste management is very far behind. They only have one uh, circulating fluidized bed, it's a waste to energy plant, but it doesn't treat municipal solid waste because of the public opposition. People are, do not really want these technologies over there. So even if it's a very packed nation and they don't have much land, so they have like a few landfills, but apparently this waste to energy that treats the sewage sludge has two floors. It's one floor that uh, the combustion uh, uh, occurs, and on the other floor it's a small mall with some uh, shops and even a spa. It was even, even a spa over there. And the low pressure steam from this operation is being used for spa, which was a very interesting uh, development, at least. Yeah. Great, that's great. Um, Thanos, um, it's, it's really amazing that you're able to travel to all these places and uh, you know, get all these insights back um, to us. So uh, one of the points that I wanted to mention, you know, based on my experience in developing countries, um, is, um, you, you know, when we think about developing countries, we can just think about... So when people are talking about waste management in developing countries, they look at what's happening right now in developed nations, um, for example, Austria or Sweden in the, uh, in, you know, in the highly developed nations or in US and uh, England, and uh, they say, you know, that's where we should be, therefore, you know, we need those systems right away, you know, right now which is not a wrong way to look at it, but then you'll also have to put an additional variable into this kind of thinking, which is time. So you have to also see how much time it took them to get there. And, um, you know, there, there's a very uh, famous proverb or adage which, which says, you know, Rome was not built in a day. Uh, it's the same with anything, you know, not, none of these uh, large scale systems will be built in a day. So I think um, it's important um, for us to understand that when you're just starting out, um, in, in, in waste management. I mean, this is something that we've discussed with Andy Whiteman yesterday, uh, day before yesterday, uh, um, where uh, he, he classifies cities on, based on their waste management systems into different bands. And then he says, if you're in one of these classification, then you have to do um, so and so to get to the next, next tier. Uh, you can't just uh, jump from one level to three or four or five levels ahead. You have to go step by step and then you know, do incremental change. So there, I want to mention that if you if you're just if you're a um, city or if you're a um, country who are just starting out on on waste management, then you should probably look at um, uh, large scale technologies to start with, where which are which can accept as much uh, waste as possible, uh, all kinds of and as many kinds of waste as possible. Um, I think it was, um, uh, for example, um, if you take a landfill you know, it's very forgiving, right? I mean, it takes all kinds of waste and that kind of gives a um, economy of scale to be able to operate that landfill. It really helps in the initial stages. Once you have a, a landfill as the bedrock of your waste management system, then you can work on diverting waste away from the landfill. And again, uh, even moving to landfills should not happen right away from an open dump site. Maybe you should be able to manage the open dump site first and then move to a landfill once you have enough capacity within the country or within the city to, to be able to move that. And then I think you can move to waste to energy. And once you have um, in large cities, uh, in really large cities, you can move to waste to energy. And once you have these two in place, then you have enough time and um, uh, resources to work on, uh, simultaneously work on recycling, public awareness and education. Um, Otherwise, all you're doing is uh, you're doing uh, you're like an emergency fighter. You're just thinking about that initial uh, that moment right then, the public health that is being caused at that point, and you're not really thinking about what to do in the future, five years or ten years down the line, uh, down the line. And uh, recycling programs and education programs take that kind of time. So uh, it's really important that you know you kind of put the time frame in your decision making model, and then take. Um, decisions based on that. So uh, do you have any thoughts on all of this? What, what, what's your experience? Absolutely. I don't really agree with you. And everything is a matter of evolution. We cannot actually expect things to be done overnight. 
we're here now today with open dumps and the very next morning we're going to have integrated solutions with advanced recycling and it's from waste recovery from the residues etc and i totally agree with you that we have to evaluate and assess the case by case scenario because all uh, the countries and all the communities have different local characteristics so for example uh, in india when i was in delhi I saw a very, very successful transformation of an open dump to a sanitary landfill with an advanced methane recovery, which was something fantastic. It was a great development. And this apparently alleviated the problem of open dumps and pushed uh, the way forward to uh, sustainability. Because in, many, in some cases, waste to energy is not very affordable for the communities. And uh, because, again, waste to energy, it's a very, uh, it's an advanced process and it involves combustion of waste, we have to be very, very conscious on the implementation of this technology and we have to be able to transfer the know-how from other regions because apparently a stigma and a failure in this technology will put a stigma to this very successful technique as has been applied in Europe, Asia, America, etc., etc. But I totally agree with you, everything is a matter of an evolution, but we have to face the reality, we have to be very pragmatic with the real problem, assess the problem and identify the best available solutions for the citizens and for the public health as well. And recycling, composting and reducing of the waste, we've seen some very successful techniques and some very successful initiatives in Europe, especially in the Western and North European part, of Europe. However, this, as you very well said, takes a lot of time. Or even in Korea, in, the, in the South Korea, they uh, managed to increase all these rates, recycling, composting and waste to energy, in about 20 years' time. However, some nations like India or like South America, they don't have much time. Plus, it, it has to do with some cultural characteristics. Because, for example, the Koreans or the Austrians or the Danish people are very, very supportive and they really trust the government and the different stakeholders. So if it is a law, if it is a regulation from the nation, from the government, people will respect that and will follow the rule. While some other regions of the world, like for example, maybe in India or South America, they're not very, very supportive with the government and they're not really keen on listening to the regulators. Coming from the Eastern European part also, you can tell from my, from my name, you know this also already, uh, I know that, for example, in Greece or in Bulgaria, in the eastern part of Europe, people, even if they have a legislation, they do not really pay attention to it. And this obviously creates huge problems towards sustainability. Um, right. It's also uh, the ability of um, the governments to be able to monitor or implement um, such issues, isn't it? I mean, um, if, if uh, you're putting a policy or a regulation in place, then um, isn't it also on the government to be able to put proper systems in place to be able to monitor and implement them? Um, mm -hmm. Otherwise, um, it's a way of, uh, otherwise it leads to people uh, losing um, trust in the government or not really caring about the regulations that come later on. Exactly, exactly. And the most successful uh, model, at least, as you have seen this around the world, uh, was the European Directive. They had, they had they developed a very clear framework, a centralized, framework able to be adapted and adopted to the national members so it was a centralized model uh, targeting aiming to the central decentralized communities uh, however again many many countries like the western european countries the northern european countries followed this great initiative and great directives and guidelines however some other regions didn't and they were preferring to receive the huge fine from the european commission rather than applying this law into their national law and really advance the nations. So that's why it's like has to do it's case by case. But I mean, the main outcome is that uh, you have to pass through this evolution in order to achieve this integrated, advanced, and sustainable waste management systems. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, also, Thanos, so tell me a little bit more about um, the kind of research that's going on at um, uh, Earth Engineering Center, Columbia University and um, tell us a little bit about the projects that you're working on and you know what kind of uh, publications have we seen in the past few years from you what kind of you know what, what are you, mm -hmm. some of the latest findings yes, so our research is associated we do have at the moment about 20 researchers in our center and uh, we're working in a variety of subjects that ranges from uh, 
the public health issues. This was in collaboration with the John Hopkins University and the Public Health School also of Columbia University. This was about the evolution of public health and how this was linked with the waste management for the case of New York. So we did a historical analysis starting from the early 20th century, back in the 1900s. And down to the 2017 and plus we did some projections for the future with respect uh, to the plan that was introduced by the New York Department of Sanitation. And uh, we do have some other issues which are really engineering crisis. What, what, what were the findings from that study? What are? What were the findings? So back in the early 19th century, in the early zeros, people were not aware about the waste problem and they were actually collecting the waste and throwing, it, throwing it this into the Hudson River. Or even they were just burying it and uh, uh, burning it in, in open areas. Uh, however, this passed through an evolution, and then we had the landfill, the fresh kills landfills, then we have some incinerators, but it was not waste to energy, it was incinerators. Without this state of the art air pollution control system, without the production of energy, as we have seen, and this created some adverse effects in the communities, and that is why for some time incineration, incineration of hospital waste, of medical waste, of even household waste was banned for some time in New York because it was associated with huge dioxin emissions and created some adverse effects. And then we had this environmental movement that started in the early 70s and, then, and this pushed the recycling composting forward. However, New Yorkers prefer to transport the waste, their waste, over long distances rather than building some advanced infrastructure like waste to energy or even a landfill. So they prefer to use diesel trucks and send this, which diesel trucks emit particulate matters, and these are associated again with public health issues, rather than building some uh, infrastructure. So this was the main, yeah. And when we compare the scenarios between waste to energy and landfill, which one is better for the case of New York, in terms of the public health, we found that uh, if we have waste to energy, the carcinogens and the non-carcinogens, constituents that uh, are contained in the waste are five about five times less as compared to the landfilling of the waste. So the ideal solution is to incentivize people towards recycling composting and do and develop some waste to energy plants. For for the non, uh, post post um, recycling uh, post recycling waste post recycling waste yeah right right okay recycling waste yeah. Okay, and uh, what are the researchers happening? Um, and you know, what are your findings from that? For that, this was the main finding that the ideal uh, New York has to develop, has to build at least two waste to energy no, plants. No, one, no, yeah, no. Sorry, I was asking about other research. Ah, sorry, sorry, did I hear that? Yeah. So yeah. the other research we're currently doing is in Indian Point. Indian Point, which is located uptown, uh, there were some nuclear reactors, and now this site has been commissioned decommissioned and um, now uh, it's, it's an area of 250 acres and we are designing, we are doing a pre-feasibility study about uh, a building of a materials recovery facility able to recover many recyclables and produce either a high quality fuel, an RDF or an SRF to be further used in the cement industry which is located upstate New York or uh, do a waste to energy plant right next to the MRF or the MBT. So this will be like an integrated solution which will, which will have recycling composting and then the post recycling will go either to the cement industry or to a waste to energy facility. And this is yeah. what I've seen and this apparently what I've seen in Barcelona in Spain where I was about a year ago where it was the, a great development, the Mataró facility in Barcelona, where they have an advanced mechanical biological treatment facility and this is followed by a waste to energy. Because all these plants, the MBT plants, the MRF plants, if they receive mixed municipal solid waste, their efficiency are significantly low. So you have an efficiency of the recovery products of about maybe 15 to 20 per weight percent. With that being said, about maybe 50% will eventually either end up to a landfill or to a waste to energy facility. And that is why in Barcelona they had this MBT followed by waste to energy. And this is a similar approach we want to uh, do for the Indian point. This right. has just started. Another project we have, uh, we're starting now, it's about the development of some indicators. 
uh, able to because this is very very important because for example even in the national level uh, for example some nations are claiming to have 60 percent recycling but this is not the actual recycling that is being done in the communities is the waste that it has been disposed of in a bin in a blue bin in a green bin or whatever the color is in the communities so that's just the waste that is being collected for recycling collect, collect, exactly collected for recycling however the actual recycling is what goes to the secondary markets or what is being reprocessed for the production of new material of other materials that is why for example european union at the moment they are revisiting the definition of the recycling rates and composting rates as well and this is a project we're currently doing in collaboration with the civil engineering department at the data center of columbia university to develop some very stable and robust indicators able to monitor the progress and thereafter forecast also and see how far you can go uh, with regards to the sustainable waste management because information is the very first step towards sustainability then we do have some other projects about the utilization the beneficial uses of the residues from the waste to energy operations. This is an experimental work we are doing again in collaboration with the civil engineering department and we are processing the bottom masses, the residues of these operations um, for the production of concrete blocks which can be used for civil engineering applications. And this is some successful examples we've seen in Denmark, in the, on the northern part of Europe, in the Netherlands, in the western part, in England, Right, right. Yeah. And um, I know you've also had um, some publications recently um, in the past two to three years on, you know, uh, waste management on waste energy. Um, I know there's been one on the dioxin level from waste energy plants. Uh, absolutely, absolutely. This was this is one of the main concerns and this actually did what creates uh, the public opposition in some cases about the dioxins that are being emitted uh, from waste to energy. So um, this is, was a study that was done by Professor Themelis, who is the director of the center, and one of his students in 2014, uh, Henry Dwyer, uh, and they developed a dioxin inventory for the U.S. So in total, the 77 facilities, waste to energy plants in America, emit in total three grams toxin equivalent per normal cubic meter, because everything is how we compare it with. So the alternative for the post-recycled waste is landfilling. And surprisingly, in the States, the landfill fires, the unintentional landfill fires, because in most, in most cases, landfills uh, have unintentional fires. So in total, all the landfills in America, surprisingly, the total emissions were 1,300 grams, 1,300 grams, as compared to the three grams that were emitted by waste to energy. On an average, because we did um, some inventory studies for the case of France, Korea, and China, on an average, all the facilities we've seen and we have done all these experimental and uh, analysis for the plants uh, indicate a tenfold to a hundredfold uh, dioxin emissions below the national established limits. So we're talking about very safe in, uh, information. Another uh, research that we did, because from my observations, uh, where, about the location of waste to energy plants, that most of these plants are located within the, within the city center, but we didn't have any graph or any uh, uh, picture to depict this. So what we did, we developed a graph which has on the x-axis the capacity of the plants in tons per day, and on the y-axis it shown the distance of these plants from the city center that this serve. So, for example, Columbia University is located in 116th Broadway. The city center would be Times Square. So, the average distance was 4.8 kilometers. So, that means we could, we could have a plant, a plant here in Columbia University, which is exactly inside the center, but the city center is in Times Square. So, that is why all these plants are serviced marbles in the communities. Like, for example, in Denmark and Copenhagen, now they are opening a plant with a ski slope on top, or in Spitelau in Vienna. It's uh, considered to be one of the top 10 sightseeings. Right, and um, this brings me back to what um, Kirsty Pecci said in the previous uh, um, um, session, uh, in the previous uh, interview. Um, she did mention that about there are about 800 uh, landfill fires. 
um, in, in the US, um, which happen um, annually. Um, so uh, I just want to mention this. Um, so uh, on, on the B-Waste Vibes platform, we discuss both, you know, the pros and cons of, you know, all technologies. So uh, it, it's really a, a platform where, you know, people have uh, the ability to um, actually, uh, you know, get good, good uh, information on um, the technologies from all, all perspectives. And um, another thing that I wanted to mention was, uh, you know, given uh, our, uh, today's politics where um, everything is a bite-sized information, all the news comes in bite-sized information, and everything kind of polarizes the discussion, and there is no middle ground where, you know, people can actually, you know, work together, collaborate, and then move ahead. And uh, which is why we, we've um, moved to the format where, you know, we have um, experts come and, you know, have a discussion where we share ideas, you know, where we debate and discuss, you know, uh, stuff for about 45 minutes so that, you know, people can watch this and then, you know, get to their own conclusions and, you know, and, and then make change in their uh, li uh, local localities based on that. So, um, Absolutely, it's a great initiative. Sorry to interrupt you. Big Waste Wise is a great initiative, and the Global Waste Management Dialogue is something very, very important for our world because apparently most of the people are not aware of the different technologies and they're not aware about what does an integrated and sustainable waste management mean. So we have to be able to inform the people through this great initiative like Big Waste Wise is and the, the Global Waste Management Dialogue. And that is why the Earth Engineering Center is very, very supportive. With this initiative, um, I really believe in this great idea. Yeah, thank you, Thanos. I mean, um, we we'll always had support from the Earth Engineering Center, so thanks about that. And um, so, could you also talk uh, a little bit about um, other publications that you've had recently? Because you do do a lot of research. Yes, for sure. For example, another study that we did recently was about the life cycle analysis, because our center has two core research activities. The one is about waste management and sustainable waste management. And the other is about industrial ecology, which means it's about life cycle analysis issues and circular economy subjects. So how to close a loophole, how to identify some byproducts that can be used as a feedstock to another process, like, for example, the concrete project I referred to earlier. So another a recent publication we did, again, with Professor Themelis, it was about the use of uh, the waste materials in the cement industry. So we did, and this was, we included some case studies uh, from San Antonio, from some plants in San Antonio in uh, the States. And um, this was some uh, recycling plants. Um, Thomas, the lighting is bad um, because I think yeah, it was behind Just it. give me one second, sorry for that, because you know, it's like, it's the automatic light. Yeah, just give me one yeah. second, sorry for that. So sorry for that. No worries. Um, maybe because maybe because sabotage from <laughs> <laughs> automatic yeah. light. So it turns off if there is no movement. But I saw that you were moving a lot on, in your chair. But yeah, uh, no. But maybe I don't know. Maybe you know you know the office how it is. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Yeah. Anyway, maybe, maybe because of my size, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you didn't pick up your moment. All right. Great. Yeah. So so you were we about... compared. We compared, for example, what if we have an RDF, a refuse derived fuel, which is the byproduct of the MRF operations, it's a high calorific value product. And what is better to combust this in a cement kiln, to combust this in a waste to energy plant, or to landfill it, as it's currently being done. And the LCA proved that uh, in this case, the best solution is to combust this in the cement kilns, both on the environmental perspective, but most importantly, on the economics perspective. Because apparently the cement industry pays uh, the waste management operator to receive this as a fuel, and you are avoiding the cost that is involved to build a waste energy plant. And that's why I said also in earlier that in, we have to assess the local characteristics. Like in some cases, we can have an MRF plant, and then the RDF, if it's a cement industry nearby, it can be a great fuel for them. Another project we did was about in Chile, and now we're finishing this paper. It was about a legislative framework in order to, uh, to advance the role of the informal recyclers to the formal recycling system, which is something very, very important, as we discussed in the very beginning of our uh, panel, of our discussion. Right. And then we did another uh, life cycle analysis, which was about the plastic materials. And we compared a, a newly developed product 
that uh, it's uh, from from England as compared to the current uh, plastic uh, materials. Right. Could you talk a little bit right. more? Could you talk a little bit more? I know. It's, I know. Marine, marine. Which is a big yeah. issue right now. So, could you talk a little bit more about the project? Yeah, it was a huge issue, and uh, this was the problem we had also when we were trying to assess uh, the marine littering part. You know this already. Uh, so, uh, what we did actually, um, yeah, I mean, the main problem for this, for the plastic waste, is that most of this waste ends up in the ocean, so the so called marine littering, and there are no solutions for this. And that and this associated with some huge environmental problems, which are not very easy to assess because we don't know the quantity that ends up in the oceans and creates this marine littering. And because of the shape of the different plastic waste streams and plastic materials, we cannot really assess the uh, adverse effect that all these materials have in our environment and in, our, in uh, the abiotic and the marine, uh, the aquatic environment also. Mm -hmm. um, so, also so you, uh, the community again has to provide some very good solutions for this. Uh, last summer, uh, I was like in the in Germany. I visited Germany, but uh, I, I met a professional who was from Malta. Malta is right next to Italy, on the southern part of Europe, and uh, he told me about a great initiative on, on how to reduce the plastic bags from the supermarkets. Because apparently, the community they didn't have a lot of money to support these initiatives. What the supermarkets did, they produced some thicker bags. With that being said, I mean, people were going to the supermarkets, buying their products, and then the bag would, uh, couldn't withstand the weight of any product. And that's actually pushed the citizens to use their own bags. And this reduced significantly the use of the plastic bags. And it was a, yeah, it was a very, very interesting. And now I want to explore this also in the near future to see how they did it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. What kind of behavior a uh, thinner bag leads Absolutely, to? because this is very important. It's a social behavior. I've never heard of anything like this. It's really new. So um, yeah. Yeah. it's very, very, it's very, very difficult apparently to change the social behavior. Right, right. Okay. I mean, a very, a very successful initiative was in England, in the UK, the United Kingdom, where they invest uh, about a lot of time and effort through through some uh, smart advertisement. So they had like a huge social campaign in all the cities of the UK and they had some very smart logos like I recycle for my education, I recycle for the team and uh, they had like some small fans. I was thinking when I grow up I want to become an helicopter indicating like the concept of upcycling, of recycling of the materials. So um, this apparently in the beginning you don't, you know, you just don't care about it because you're not working in waste management. But if you see this every single day for many, many years, so the very next time that you will go to your household, you have like the aluminium, but maybe, maybe the conscious will uh, sort of separate your materials. And that is yeah. why through this very yeah. smart social campaign, uh, recycling and composting crates in the UK, in 2000, they were about 10, 12 percent. In 2010, they were about uh, 45 percent. Obviously, they provided some huge incentives. The main in, in his, uh, subsidy that they gave in the UK. So they started this social campaign and then they increased significantly the landfill gate fee. So they made, in order to face, in order to avoid this public opposition against waste to energy, they did an indirect method. So they increased the landfill tax and then the communities couldn't really send, the, they couldn't afford the disposition of the post-recycled waste to landfills. And that's created the integrated system, very high levels of recycling and composting, and the post-recycling for combustion. Right, right. And uh, we have only about um, seven minutes um, to go. So, uh, you know, when you're talking about this, uh, time does fly really fast. So, um, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So, Thanos, um, can you talk a little bit about uh, the future uh, that you see in the next five years or, or maybe in the next 20 years um, for, you know, waste management systems um, mm -hmm. worldwide? You know, uh, what, what's happening in North America? Um, what's happening in North America? What's happening in Latin America? You know, what kind of future do you see that for the, those two? And what's happening in uh, Africa, Sub-Saharan Africa and East Africa? And also what's happening um, in Asia, Southeast Asia, and Middle East. Um, so, 
that's a very good question. So, yeah, so in North America, uh, what lacks is a federal legislation. Able, like as we said earlier, in Europe, they had this very, very strong uh, guidelines and directives that accelerated the transition from the landfills to the integrated waste management systems. In the States, apparently the rates has remained exactly the same since the late, the late 90s. So uh, there was only one plant, waste energy plant, that was built in West Palm Beach in Florida, a very big plant, one million tons per year by Babcock and Wilcox. Uh, however, now we've seen, we are seeing some movement, but now it's the new administration that uh, we don't know exactly what the plan would be talking about the environment. So, uh, however, uh, America, because leads this effort of the technological evolution, we can see a solution, at least at the production stage of all the materials, through this technological evolution. For example, Apple recently launched uh, a robot able to disassemble the iPhone into 130 different parts. And this apparently may solve the, the very, very big problem of waste electronics. We've seen in some communities in the States, like in New York, like in Boston, Massachusetts, some significant efforts towards recycling. But again, you cannot really achieve these integrated solutions if you don't have waste to energy, which has been exactly the same since the late, late 90s. In South America, because you asked me, uh, now there are some successful, uh, they are taking the legislation from Europe the EPR, the extent it produces responsibility. The, we've seen, for example, in Chile or in Colombia, some very successful initia uh, initiatives towards uh, recycling and waste to energy. Now, for, uh, in Brazil also, in Sao Paulo, now they opened a tender for a waste to energy plan. The same is true for uh, Medellin in Colombia. So, however, these regions uh, are suffering from these huge political problems and the uh, high corruption so and this may block uh, some public and private partnerships and may block uh, the efforts that can be done towards the advancement of sustainable waste management and the same is true for some african countries uh, talking about asia as i mentioned in the very beginning asia like china did exhibit indicated phenomenal growth on waste to energy and now they're in a very good position to invest in recycling and composting. So now, for example, uh, they are building the first mechanical biological treatment plant in Nanjing, and there are some other tenders for MBT and MRFs. So in China, they took it the other way around. Um, India, uh, as, we, as we discussed also earlier, uh, now they're doing some significant efforts to advance recycling, composting, and the new administration is very, very supportive uh, with the, all these schemes and the sustainability. And I really believe in this new administration that can really do some things and push some things forward. But again, they have some stakeholders have to face the reality. What other I, that I've seen in India was about pyrolysis. It was about the plastic waste. But there are many, many small scale plans for the utilization, the processing of plastic waste through pyrolysis, small scale plants, six to 12 tons per day, for the production of some oil, of high quality oil. And this can solve the problem of plastic, but you can still have some other problems to deal with. Right, right, right. Okay. Um, so uh, th with that, I think we just have um, two more minutes. So um, do you have any concluding thoughts? Um, any, anything that, you know, yeah, I mean, the main conclusion from all these observations is that we have to face the reality. We have to see what is happening. We have to be pragmatic and realistic and provide some real engineering solutions for the citizens and for the public health, because not waste management is a public health problem. That, uh, and if we have some integrated sustainable waste management solutions for the community, this advances aesthetically the community also, because all these uh, techniques are served as marbles in the community. But as you were very well said, and as we know already, we have to pass through an evolution and we cannot expect things to be happening overnight. We have to invest in time and effort to raise the public awareness and simultaneously develop some solutions to move away from the open dams which from my observations is the concept 
for the developing nations and to move away from landfills for the developed nations. And developing and developed is not defined by the GDP or the HDI, it's defined, for, it's defined in our field, in waste management. Right. Um, so uh, with that, I think we can end this session. And I just have um, uh, one point to make, which is um, um, this session, we talked a lot about engineering solutions. And uh, before this, we talked a lot about um, social solutions and behavioral change solutions. And um, I want to end um, all of this by um, the, the 2017 Global Dialogue on Ways by saying that um, you know, we have to use both engineering solutions and social solutions and behavioral change solutions um, together combined based on, you know, which is required more. Now, let's take an example uh, that, uh, you know, um, let's say there are, uh, there is a village or, you know, a group of towns who are living in an island and they have to get to the, uh, you know, the mainland, then uh, it's not just enough to change behaviors, you know, how much ever you change the behavior, there is no way that you can get them to the, to the mainland. Uh, what you need is a technological solution like a bridge um, or, uh, you know, better ships or uh, ferries for you to get them there. Um, like but the case of Bermuda. In Bermuda, they have a small scale waste to energy plant and now they're combusting the waste, they're producing electricity, which is another problem for the islands, and they're advancing the recycling. Sorry to interrupt, yeah. Right. And, and, um, but, but this engineering solution, yeah. Right. And then um, you also have um, situations where uh, social solutions and uh, uh, technological solutions work together, for example, in the provision of sanitation. Uh, where people have to use, um, where people have to stop open defecation and then use uh, toilets. Um, there you need the infrastructure and you also need the behavior change. And um, I think waste management is also a similar problem where um, it, it, it's so interlinked with every person, like every person has a role to play. And therefore there is a huge behavior change uh, uh, part of it. And um, there is also a huge technology uh, and engineering solutions point of view. And depending upon the local situations, we have to um, assess the local situations and then, you know, take a decision on which one you should do and what kind of timelines we have, what kind of short term, medium term and long term priorities we have and what kind of, uh, you know, infrastructure or behavioral change solutions that we should use in, in, in such situations. Exactly. exactly. And we have to have a very clear plan. And as you very well said, I mean, uh, the social perspective is very, very important. Because apparently we do have two phenomena. The one is an NIMBY, not in my backyard, and the other is not in my political term. So we have to have very strong politicians also to support on this initiative and able to provide some strong uh, subsidies or some strong initiatives for the people to change behavior. But we've seen some very successful startup companies or some, some very smart applications that are moving towards this direction to create some incentives like some rewarding systems in order to accelerate this effort of uh, the social perspective of these subjects, which is very, very important, significantly important. Right, great. Wonderful. Thanks. With that, I think uh, this is the end of uh, the 2017 Global Dialogue on Ways. Thank you, Thanos, for joining us. And no, thank you very much, for giving me the opportunity. And, you know, I mean, if we, the two of us keep on continuing this discussion, we're going to uh, discuss for day and nights. <laughs> we're like, going to have a never-ending session. Right, right. So, and, and the, the last session, uh, which is uh, supposed to be uh, an interview with Iswad, uh, a waste management company from Belgium. Uh -huh. um, so, uh, because of scheduling conflicts, we couldn't, rec uh, we couldn't uh, have a live session with them. We pre-recorded the interview. So, we have the interview already um, ready and in the next, um, uh, by, by the end of, well, let's say in the next 24 hours, you'll uh, receive a link to those who have already registered. You'll receive a link with a, um, a link to the interview and then and you can watch. So if you have any questions okay. or comments, because it's a pre-recorded interview, uh, if you have any questions or comments, send it to us and then we'll try to get them answered. Um, fantastic. fantastic, fantastic. And once again, Rajin, thank you very much for giving me this opportunity. Yeah, thanks, Thanos. Have to be part of the great initiative of the Global Waste Management Dialogue and of the big waste West community. Yeah, great. Thank you very much, Thanos. Have a good day. Thank you very much, friend. Okay. Bye. Bye. Yeah. Okay. Hello friends, uh, welcome to the 2017 Global Dialogue on Waste. Since 2013, we've uh, brought more than uh, 150 practitioners and thought leaders from around the world um, to disseminate knowledge um, on waste. And um, 
this knowledge would otherwise be confined to uh, long PDF reports or to paywall websites or to um, uh, expensive international conferences. So, um, and um, today, um, as for the interview, we have um, Crystal Molar, who's the director of ISFAG. Um, ISFAG is a waste management company in uh, Belgium. And um, ISWAG has been a very strong supporter of uh, Be Waste Wise uh, and communications in the waste management from the very beginning. So uh, thank you very much um, for the support. And um, because of their support, uh, we wanted to understand, you know, why they were supporting us and, you know, why they um, care about communications and waste management, which, which is why we have Crystal here today with us. Um, my name is uh, Ranjit Anepu. I'm a co-founder of Be Waste Wise. And um, today, uh, with Crystal, we'll be talking about um, uh, gaining uh, community trust. I mean, in this age today, um, people are losing um, trust in governments and institutions. And in in such a uh, in such a in such a time, we wanted to find out how a waste management company and that to a waste to energy company uh, uh, generally uh, deals with community trust and you know how how it engages with um, its community stakeholders and the, the reason we're looking at it is um, every uh, waste management facility whether it's composting recycling facility or tra transfer station all of them have a public opposition but uh, severe public opposition but when it comes to waste to energy and landfills uh, the opposition does peak which is why we're really interested in how this um, uh, deals with it how it engages with them and how uh, with the community and how it builds that uh, very important trust um, with them. So um, ISWAG um, is already operating a plant in um, the city of Antwerp and it treats uh, the residual waste from about 1 million people. And um, they are currently, uh, and this plant in its early stages um, had, prob had public opposition, but um, ISWAG, um, I, I, right now, I think Iswag and the community are good neighbors. Um, they've uh, gone through this. They've mm -hmm. been very transparent. And uh, Iswag is right now investigating a new plant in the same location um, uh, next to the existing plant. Um, and once the new plant, uh, and the plan is once a new plant is constructed, the old plant will be decommissioned and the new plant would be much more efficient. It will also generate uh, heat and electricity. And the new plant only generates, uh, the old plant only generates electricity at this point so um so let me um begin with my questions for crystal and then uh so and then we'll take it from there so uh, hi crystal thank you very much um, for joining us today hi Ranji. thank you for the invitation no problem all right so um well uh, let me start with my first question now um it is said that good companies always uh, get a license to operate even in tough projects yes all others will always struggle, even in easy projects. And when it comes to Iswag, you got your license to operate for your current plan. So what do you think um, the others are missing? I think we have to be reluctant for generalization. Being what you call a company is not enough, it's not sufficient. In the 90s, Iswag was a good company and we were respecting all the regulations Nevertheless, we ended up in a crisis situation with our neighborhood. Regulation and emotions are two different things. Even when your company does better than the reg regulations prescribed, even though you have to take care of public acceptance and be aware of public acceptance. Um, even for a good company in waste management, there is no such a thing as an easy project. For this fact, getting our license uh, to operate the current plant was not an easy walk in the park. And even today, we have to earn it every day over and over again. What helped us a lot during the project over the past year is um, complete transparency and getting into a dialogue. We have, for example, more than 5,000 visitors visiting our plant every year again. Informing people is good, but talking to people and listening to their concern is much better. So it's not uh, efficient when you only give information. You have to listen to what they say or want to say. Every single question, I think, 
get a question, when they uh, phone us, when they send us an email, we try to respond uh, the same day as soon as possible. Uh, what we also do is putting our story in a broader local perspective. It's not just our plan. We are a part of a complete story, and the story is a circular economy in which you always need a fallout where you need to sink some products are not able to be recycled, reused, they are end of lifetime. And there we are the solution. What we always say it's about people's waste. It's not our waste. They bring their waste to our plant and we treat the waste. We are a solution, we are not the problem. We try to put it in a, a broader local perspective, but also in a broader international perspective. We are a local prey. Player. We are an intermunicipal organization, but even though we take initiatives on international level by setting up collaborations and uh, because we want to exchange knowledge, knowledge and best practices. Uh, we advise communities when they ask us. We go to cities and uh, to learn how they work, how they uh, get on with the project, uh, where we can learn of. It helps us to get better knowledge and to get awareness about latest developments and it helps us also to define our exact role and position in our sector and in debates. We try to refer to situations not only in Belgium, not only in Antwerp, but good and bad situations we have seen in other countries. I don't hear you anymore. Sorry, um, no, thank you, I muted myself. So, um, all right, so um, we know ISWAG had um, public opposition in the end, and you actually say that you have to do this um, every day, um, you know, it's not a one-time effort. So, um, so considering that throughout ISWAG, you know, what was the biggest crisis you faced with the community, and, you know, how, what steps did you take, how did you overcome um, um, it was in the late 90s, there was a Belgium and Dyson crisis and our neighbors started up a legal procedure against ISFA. We had protesters in front of the gate um, and people wanted to close down ISFA. And at that, at that point, we made an uh, analysis of what we did wrong and we saw that there was a problem with our communication. Each year we published, we published a technical report because we were obliged by legislation, but that was it. So that's what I said before. We didn't listen to what people wanted, the information they wanted from us. We just handed over the technical report. Now we saw that we had to set up a communication with our neighbors, but you can ask how you set up a good understanding with, at that point, your worst opponent. We started a dialogue, but I mean a real dialogue. And in that communication, um, we showed recognition and respect for the real stakeholders. We took our time. You don't want to rush, take one step at a time, but because you don't have to convince people that you're absolutely right and that they're wrong. It's about mutual understanding. It's about showing respect for each other's opinion. And that's what we do, do since the 90s. Um, uh, that's very interesting because um, these days all public dialogues are very hyperbolic. You know, everyone talks about the extremes and there isn't much respect for each other. And uh, mm -hmm. I think one of the things that I um, frequently observe is that um, uh, experts or uh, practitioners from one field consider all others to be ignorant of mm -hmm. you know, that field and therefore consider them to be ignorant um, in general. But then they don't really um, recognize the fact that, um, recognize the fact that the other people are experts in something else and then, you know, they have that expertise and, and that all of us are trying to learn knowledge in a specific domain and therefore, you know, becoming better at that domain, but maybe we not know much about others. Therefore, whenever we're talking to others, we have to make it much more simpler for them to understand yeah. um, a basic, um, for them to understand what we're talking about. You know, 
to make sure yeah. that also what's happening. Um, all right, so um, coming to my next question. So uh, what should a project developer or a community stakeholder remember when navigating these courses on health risk, facility need, trust, and environmental justice? I'm asking this question because, uh, you know, uh, these uh, discussions are happening worldwide, you know, when a new project yeah. you know, should happen, these discussions happen. But then um, in those discussions, uh, they quickly get really heated. And then, you know, um, neither the community gets what it wants or neither the stakeholder, uh, the project developer gets uh, uh, what he, he or she wants. Uh, and therefore, you know, what should both sides be aware of and what should be what should they folk remember when, you know, navigating these courses on health risk or facility need for the facility or environmental justice? The problem is that uh, in the communication, in the communication, you mostly start from the conclusion, and the conclusion is clear for the decision maker, but not for public opinion. So we have developed a motivation, a reasoning why we concluded that our plant is relevant, why our plant is necessary, and why our plant is the best option based on all the parameters technology, mobility, economic, economy, demographics, but also legislation. And over the past year, we learned that everything is relevant. There's not uh, such a thing as uh, technology is more relevant than uh, mobility. It's all even, uh, it's all the same, it's all relevant. It depends on the specific stakeholder, what he or, he or she thinks it's relevant. Or our motto is there always that total transparency, meaning that very every every very questions get an answer. We don't look to who is asking these questions. We say every question is relevant. And give an answer to that. Before we enter in a meeting with stakeholders, for example, uh, local community, we agree on the agenda and we ask to get as many topics, questions, or remarks in advance, so we can prepare ourselves or even invite external experts on specific matters to join us for the meeting. So we can, can give clear information, objective information, not only conclusions who are coming from ourselves. Right, okay. And um, so, Another question is, um, so certain studies support the idea that um, it's not just technical knowledge deficits on the part of the residents that is at the root cause of opposition. Mm -hmm. um, I, I mean, when so someone's opposing a plant, it doesn't just mean that they're not aware of the technical um, know-how, but um, I, I think the, the problem, so certain studies say that the problem is prioritizing of different values by both the proponents and opponents. So um, when it comes to values, you know, um, uh, what's your experience and, you know, you know, what kind of values do you think fall on one side or the other and their prior priorities? And it's about mutual understanding and mutual respect and willing to listen to each other. It's not about absolutely wanting to convince the other that you're right and that they're wrong. It's our job to explain to people in clear, understandable, understandable language what is going on at uh, our plant. For example, we have to respect emission values. We do much better than the emission values, but people don't understand what this actually means. We talk about nanograms and milligrams per cubic meter. So uh, we went to the University of Antwerp and we asked uh, the professors there to make a study on uh, how our emissions relate to other sources that people know in their everyday life. How do our emissions compare to the emissions of cars, of households? And based on this information, we produce a little bro brochure, and I have it here, I don't know if you can see it, with some clear illustrations. And that makes the comparison between um, car, household, and the emissions of this site.
maybe you could put that closer to the screen. Um, the, I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, but it's in, um, it's in Dutch. So. Oh. <laughs> well, maybe that, it's, that's yours. it's an idea to make some translation. Right, yeah, <laughs> and that's the Dutch viewers, I guess. So, uh, all right, great. Um, so um, earlier, when we were talking before the um, this recording, um, and when we were talking about Iswag being good neighbors um, with the community, yeah. you, you know, um, you had uh, so you you were not co completely um, convinced with that. So, um, do you want to talk about that? Do I want to talk? I didn't hear your question, Annabelle. Uh, I'm sorry. So uh, when we were talking earlier before the recording about um, um, Iswag and the community, um, yeah, and yeah. Um, you said that certain uh, uh, people in the community uh, could not be uh, completely convinced mm -hmm. about yeah. uh, you know what you're doing and um, your transparency. So do you want to talk about that? I mean, how do you deal with you know that kind of people? Uh, that that kind of groups of people we don't ignore them um we invite them, we ask them to come over to see with their own eyes what happens here at our plant um, but we don't try to convince them we talk to them we listen to their arguments mostly it's a pure emotional debate um and and that's very difficult to give answers to those peoples People, because they, we can't say what we want to hear. They only want us to close down. And maybe they think that the green parts are taking over the installation, but that's not when we have to close down. Something else appears here on this plan. So uh, it's a very difficult communication, but we try to uh, take time for uh, this communication to listen to what their remarks are, um, and we keep investigate, investigate uh, questions. When they ask questions, we don't have always the answer. And then we go, uh, we're looking for experts to um, give us uh, scientific information to help us uh, create answers, create answers, give answers to people, and, and, and give answers to their questions. And, and the little pocket I have is, is an example of um, some of these answers. OK, all right. And um, so let me remind the viewers that um, this is a recorded version of the uh, um, interview with um, Crystal uh, from Ms. Park. Um, and um, so and you can um, tweet about this uh, by using the hashtag Ways Dialogue. Um, and of course, um, all of the recordings will be available um after um after the global dialogue on this so follow us on social media or subscribe to our monthly newsletter and then you'll you'll, you'll get all the recordings uh, for future reference so all right great so um oh, thank you crystal so um so now uh, talking about uh, these people who do not um completely are not completely convinced do you think um they are just prioritizing different values than you know what others are prioritizing you know, this is one of the questions that you know we had earlier. Do you think they're just prioritizing different values? Um, um, I don't. I I'm not sure. It's very difficult to give an answer on that. I think they they see other pictures. They see us as a problem, and um, there where we say that we're not a problem, they. Um, can give some solution to the problem they see when they go to the shop, go to the supermarket, and and they uh, they put waste into their um, their their supermarkets because they are buying packaging, and and packaging is after using it is waste. So that's something where we work on and and invite people here and tell them how they have to avoid waste, how they have to recycle. And we only treat the part that it's not recyclable. Right, right. Okay, all right. And um, so, when it comes to the current investigation for a new plant, um, how, how is that going? You know, um, what are you doing there? 
Yeah, we're uh, still uh, investigating with experts, but um, we have to invite people and uh, we'll do that on a neighbor's day. And we'll do that next month. Uh, we invite them to come over to the plant and we'll tell them about our plants. We inform them about the objectives we set ourselves, lower emissions, more efficient on producing electricity, producing heat. Uh, so we invite them and we tell them ourselves they don't have to listen to uh, read it in the newspapers. Uh, they don't have to see it on the news. We ask them to come over and tell it uh, to them in person. Okay, all right. And um, going back to the uh, problem that you had in uh, in the 90s, so what was the context? You know, what do you think led to that problem um, then? Was was there any historical um, reasons for that? Um, because I know you were talking about the dioxins crisis in the 90s. Yes, but um, there was no, not an historical reason. It just di dioxin crisis appeared. And then uh, there was new legislation, and we have to lower the emission. We have to uh, build a new park on the plant on uh, the treatment of the gas flow, uh, gas flow clean. Um, so it was more uh, a problem of, of uh, communication. We were the emissions were okay, and uh, but people didn't know what was happening over here. They saw our installation. They saw saw the stack, uh, smoke was coming out of the stack, and they were thinking, oh, that's part of the crisis. So um, we, we opened our doors and invited them in and, and to see with their own eyes what was happening over here, how we were operating the plant. Um, we put our emissions on our website so people can see every day uh, what uh, are the emissions of the installation. I think we were, were we are one of the only installations in Belgium who, do, who does that. So you can follow all the emissions on, uh, on the screen. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, so um, another question is, um, so you, you publish the emissions or uh, regularly. Um, how does that work? How does that work? Um, the regula uh, Sorry, not the regulations, but the emissions. Um, yes. So do you, uh, how do you communicate the emissions to the public? Are they published regularly? And yes, each day you can uh, see the new um, the emissions of the day before on the website. So, uh, direct link between uh, the installation and the website. Okay, and uh, since you started that, you know what kind of reactions did you get um, to doing this? Most of the people say, uh, we know there's not a problem at this fact, everything is okay, we, uh, we know that coming out of the stack, it's clear, it's, it's, it's water. Um, so that's a, a way to convince people, and that's what I say, the transparency, we, we uh, think that's very important. Mm -hmm. and, Show people uh, what you do. Yeah, yeah. And I think um, uh, since you're mentioning transparency, I think transparency is really um, a problem in um, developing countries these days when it comes to waste management infrastructure. Um, they don't seem to be too transparent and um, you know, no community engagement whatsoever. So um, they're also um, uh, facing more public opposition. Mm -hmm. I mean, they plant, uh, I think the first successful plant in India, mm -hmm. uh, which is in Delhi. Um, and they had no community engagement, and then community doesn't know what can the emissions come out of it, or um, even if they do, I mean, they can't believe in it. Um, so mm -hmm. there's a lot of transparency there. So uh, for someone who's already gone through this um, uh, path of no transparency for a while, uh, you know, what do you, what kind of suggestions do you have um, to such operators? I think you have to show people what's in for them. Um, you have to listen to people. And for example, there's a problem with uh, a water cleaning, or uh, maybe you can treat the water of a, a river nearby the installation in, in your plant, and, and um, together with the waste, uh, with the treatment of the waste. So you have to look for mutual goals. 
and see what's in for, for uh, the developers, but also what's in for the neighbors, for the stakeholders. Right, right. Okay. Um, and so what are the most frequently asked questions for you at the, at the plant when someone comes there? You know, what are they concerned about mostly? Uh, not, they're not concerned about the thing. They ask, why are you located here? Why don't you go to the harbor? Um, yeah. um, that's the, the question we have the most. Why are you mm. located here nearby the city? But mm. uh, that's something about transport. When you're nearby the city, you're nearby the, the place where the waste is produced. So you don't have to drive long distance with the waste. And mm. in return, you can give uh, electricity and heat, uh, district heating to the neighborhood. And mm. that's not possible when you're uh, far away from uh, the city center. Right, right. But um, then, even if you're in, yeah. in the harbor, you could give electricity there, right? Yeah, but, but in the harbor, there are lots of uh, installation who can do steam. So they have the heat, they have the, the, the capacity to deliver heat to each other, but, but they, they're not interested yet. Right, right. Okay, okay. All right. Um, and... Um, Okay, and um, so now when it comes to location, um, you know, the I, I mean, we always have to, I think, talk about the not in my backyard, um, mm -hmm. you know, phenomena. And um, so, and it's also very interrelated with environmental justice, you know, at least in the US, um, we see that uh, waste handling facilities are built in low income neighborhoods. Um, and um, so, how do you deal with those issues, you know, with the environmental justice issue, which is, you know, very um, I think important. that's not comparable in Belgium. Uh, you see okay. the of uh, smaller uh, installation um, nearby the city centers. You see it also in Scandinavian countries uh, where they build smaller installations as, a, as an energy hub who gives uh, use the waste as a material and give back electricity and, and heat that's produced by using the waste as a material instead of fossil fuels. Right, right. Okay, okay. And, um, all right. Okay. And um, so what are your future plans with uh, with the plant right now and uh, with the upcoming, uh, well, the investigation for, for the new plant? Uh, we hope we'll have a permit in uh, mid-2018 and we can start the, uh, the um, process to, to building up new plants. When it's finished, and that must be in 2022, then, um, and after commissioning the new plant, we will um, close down the old installation. I call it the old installation, but it's the existing installation because it's in, in, in new state but uh, the new one will be more uh, energy effective and, and will have lower, even low emissions than the existing plant. Mm -hmm. All right, all right. And um, so mid-2018, so um, this seems to be a very um, lengthy permitting process. Um, yep. Would you suggest something like this for developing countries? Oh, it's, it takes a long time because there is a public investigation. We right. have uh, to put our plans online and go to tell people about our plans and they can give their suggestions and their comments on our plans. So we have to respond to, the, to these comments. That's why it takes a very long period. Okay. okay. All other stakeholders, um, like the city of Antwerp, um, and, and can take part of that uh, investigation. Mm -hmm. This actually uh, reminds me of uh, my conversation with um, Philip once. I mean, he was telling me about how um, uh, there were people. Uh, there was an old woman who um, saw uh, emissions coming from the plant, and then she wanted to find out what it was. I mean, uh, and then you took her to the place, and then you showed that it was a men's bathroom, and it was just steam coming out of there. 
So um, yeah. that kind of um, stayed with me. Um, so, uh, yeah. That's uh, all about communication. People see things and, and make some conclusions and, and sometimes they're wrong. So you can only convince them by bringing them in, invite them in and show them what is happening over here. Right. How do we teach their ways? Right. And um, do you have any such experiences, I mean, uh, with people um, with respect to, uh, you know, communicating with them, um, their questions or... When people uh, understand that, that you want to listen to their concern, it's all uh, very respectful. So, I don't... I never had any problems uh, of people. Um, it was never so that that we had to close down the the conversation because of of, of the attitude of the of the opponent. So it's that's when you go in debate, you can discuss about things, but you have to respect each other. Right. Okay. And um, are there any um, final comments um, that you have? We have another 10 minutes. So um, are there any final comments that you would like to talk about, you know, when it comes to um, engaging uh, the communities from the very beginning or when it comes to building the trust? Um, as I said, we you have to work step by step. In Flanders, um, we have built up a lot of experience in uh, setting up waste management, we started in the, in the in the 70s, set up a waste management, and it took us over 30 years to get where we are now. So mm -hmm. uh, you have to take your time, and you don't have uh, to look to the results of Flanders and want them uh, in a very quick period because that's um, that's not possible. You have to analyze the situation and every situation is different and when we can help we always offer to help so when people have questions they can contact us um, and we we'll see what we can do right and um, this is one of the um, issues we um, I work quite a bit in developing countries and this is one of the issues mm -hmm. that we face, um, we face there is um, so everyone looks at the final result and maybe like Austria or Belgium or the Scandinavian countries and says, oh, they're doing so much higher recycling, but we are not doing that much higher recycling. So we should get there as the, you know, um, as they just look at the recycling part and then they just say we should get there. But then they don't really see that this is all possible because of proper sanitary landfills coming first, yeah. and, you know, waste to energy coming first and then simultaneously, you know, the, uh, public education and, uh, you know, recycling increase. So they don't really um, see that. So do you, you know, what's your experience with respect to the evolution, the step-by-step -step evolution? I think um, you have to set up first the public education. That's why we have school children uh, come over to visit ISPAC and we tell them that we are the end of the whole uh, circulate system that uh, they have to recycle and reuse first before they throw things away. But uh, in India, for example, you have not uh, organized as we have, but you have the same system. People are keeping the streets clean by getting out those things who are valuable and, and they can sell again. So you have to start from what's able here and, and how you can set up um, a waste management system. But adapted to uh, the local situation you can just it's not it, it's not possible to copy our uh, waste management system system and bring it over to india and say this is the solution you have to start from below right um, we have to uh, start from scratch and you know um, go through this um, step, yeah. by step okay that makes sense um all right so um and uh, so in the global dialogue, which will happen next, but uh, with, when it comes to um, broadcasting, this video will come after the global dialogue. Um, you know, most of the global dialogue happens. Uh, a global dialogue on waste happens. So 
Uh, in the first theme, we're discussing about um, going beyond a circular economy. And there mm -hmm. we have um, Robert Crocker, an author uh, of a book called Somebody Else's Problem. And there he talks about how building infrastructure kind of locks us in into certain behaviors, even though you know consumers can do um, a lot more. So, and uh, given that waste to energy, um, uh, plants are also an infrastructure and they're mm -hmm. also long-term infrastructure. So uh, what kind of precautions do you take to make sure that it doesn't lock the system into uh, a certain pathway? But I don't agree with, with uh, his conclusion because okay. um, in Belgium, people have to pay for uh, treating their waste. They have to pay for bringing over the waste to the waste incineration plant. So when you have to pay from for something, uh, you don't set up a, a, a system you can't avoid. So I don't agree. Uh, but that would be similar with um, roads where you have to pay tolls, right? I mean, so... That's similar with? Sorry? <laughs> I didn't hear you well. Oh, okay. So, but that's similar to um, building roads where you have to pay tolls? Yes. I mean, it, it's similar, but um, don't you think his argument still stands that, you know, maybe um, building a plant with a certain scale will lead to um, you know uh, locking the city into a certain you know pathway yes but it's different at, at Istanbul because we only need to waste of uh, our stakeholders okay. uh, our shareholders mm -hmm. and that are communities we don't go um, to to the market to see is there industrial waste or commercial waste we can take in and we can treat here in our plant we're just a small plant and we only treat uh, the household waste of our uh, stakeholders, of mm. our shareholders, the communities. So I think that's a, a little bit different. Okay, so you did consider um, the long-term projections for waste management, the, the residual waste, and then uh, um, built or are building uh, the scale of the future plant? Yeah. Okay, okay, all right, wonderful. Um, great, so um, thank you very much, Crystal. and. Uh, so um, uh, friends, um, thank you very much for uh, viewing this. And based on this discussion, what we see is, uh, you know, when it comes to waste management infrastructure, we have to start from uh, step by step and evolve. And when it comes to building a waste management plan, a waste handling plant or a waste energy plant, uh, we have to um, be very transparent and um, engage with people in a very respectful manner from the very beginning. Um, and um, this is extremely important um, because uh, in countries where uh, improper waste management affects public health, um, it's important that every project or every step with, that we take, uh, uh, it's important for us to make sure that it is successful. Otherwise, when mm -hmm. if a project like that fails, then uh, you know we've lost the opportunity. Um, to make change and we'll have to wait many more years for some something similar to come up. So um, it's, I think, um, extremely important from a public service point of view for uh, even project developers to make sure that, the, you know, not just for the profit, but also for the public service point of view to make sure that the project, you know, comes to fruition. Um, so with this, um, I think we'll end this um, interview and uh, thank you very much to Crystal for joining and for, t for her time. So uh, thank you guys and uh, please um, share uh, and please subscribe to us and uh, that'll really help us uh, uh, get this knowledge to more people worldwide. Thank you, Crystal. Thank you, Ranjit. Bye.